Uh, I am joined today by my colleagues Jose Huizar and Councilman Mike Bonin. We are awaiting uh, uh, Councilmember Marquis Harris Dawson shortly, but we're going to go ahead and commence with our uh, multiple speaker cards and general public comments. So, first on the queue, we have Ms. Linda Jones. Uh, to be followed by Patricia McAllister and Moshe Greenwald on items 1, 2, and 3, as well as uh, general public comment. Your names and calls come up to the front table, please. Ms. Jones, you may commence. Yes. <clears throat> I have one minute. Uh, two minutes for the multiple items and then one minute for general public comment. Okay. Good afternoon. The homeless people that most Angelinos see every day are the homeless that live on the street. The growing crisis of the human horror, filth, and misery is right in their faces every day as they go to their stores, walk their neighborhoods, and play at their parks. This is why Angelinos voted in favor and passed Measure H and Triple H. Angelinos are trying to tell you, elected officials, that we have had enough. There is no reason that 50 to 100 giant tents can't be erected for the homeless citywide and countywide right now. All services that the homeless need to succeed are in the tents, such as social workers, mental, mental health workers, addiction counselors, transportation, showers, bathrooms, etc. San Diego has done this for their homeless, and it appears to be working. There are thousands of vacant city-owned lots on which the tents can be erected right now. No red tape, no delays, no bull. Mayor Garcetti wants to do the slow, painful experiment of setting up a few trailers for a, do a few dozen homeless downtown to see how it goes. We have 35,000 homeless in Los Angeles that need shelter now. Tell Mayor Garcetti that this will not do. Further, the no camping and no loitering laws must be enforced by police and sheriffs so that the homeless have further incentive to go to a tent shelter. If there is no reason to enforce laws, if there is no reason not to enforce laws, make the change needed to enforce them. We are watching you and will vote accordingly at election time. Thank you very, very much. Done. So that, that also included your general public comment? Yes. Okay. Patricia McAllister here, teacher, and my goal is to um, move out the legal aliens out of Section 8 and affordable housing. Uh, for the uh, HHH Permanent Supportive Housing Loan Program, I think we should make sure that MBEs and WBEs are included, so we need provisions for that. Now, since the homeless live together on the streets, while they're on the streets, we should allow them to start a little community. My observation is that the homeless problem is being treated as a nuisance to the city of Los Angeles, when in reality, the homeless people are victims of shady politics, mismanagement of city and government funds, and straight out embezzlement of taxpayers' money. We must view the homeless as victims, not deadbeats. Now, number two, to report with recommendations for expanding emergency shelter and crisis housing for Skid Row, that's why I came here three years ago and started attending these meetings. Those are my people down there, black people, and I want them off Skid Row. I have some suggestions. You ask for some, and I say Los Angeles never looks around to other cities to what they're doing. This is not unique. New York. New York started a program to pay residents who house their homeless relatives and friends $2,000 a month in Home for Holidays campaign. I say Los Angeles, we do it for a longer period of time until we can get them into housing. So we need to look around. I found this on the web. We need to start moving out the three to four million illegal aliens. You cannot tell me you can build enough housing to house these four million people in Los Angeles, mostly black and white. We have the illegal aliens living in the housing. If we get them out, we wouldn't have to build anymore. Another thing, illegal dumping. There's no such thing as illegal dumping. These people live on the street. They should have their garbage picked up just like homeowners. Like I said, they're, they're victims. So this is what I recommend we do. LASAN stands for Los Angeles Sanitation. Continue to conduct comprehensive cleaning. Every Friday, they do it in Venice. They need to do it on Skid Row and elsewhere. Have the city conduct a 
I have a general public comment. Have the city conduct a <clears throat> weekly cleanup at the homeless encampments. We can pay for those services out of the HHS funds. Put two to three large garbage cans at each site. Assign two to three people at that homeless encampment to supervise the cleanliness of the encampment. I've seen it done. There are some that are doing that. Put two to three porta potties at each homeless encampment. Have the porta potties cleaned out weekly and assign one person at each homeless encampment, giving that person the authority to communicate with a point person in the Los Angeles City's homeless coordinator's office. See, we need to start treating this as a business. These, these people are not criminals, they are victims. And many of them have died, they're sick, they have developed mental illnesses being on the street, and they have de developed diseases. So we need to treat them like American citizens, that's what they are, and get these illegal aliens out of this country. And President Trump is doing a darn good job, and he has my support 4,000%. Okay. Um, Moshe? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. I actually don't have notes. I speak to you from the heart as the rabbi of downtown Los Angeles and as a father of four children who has lived here for the last 11 years. My temple, my home, is seven blocks away on 7th and Broadway. We came to downtown knowing that this is not the most pristine neighborhood, knowing that, it's not, that it is a gritty place, ready and happy to do our part to be of service in this city. But as you know, and as every single person in this room knows, that the situation in downtown is now intolerable. I know that there's a homeless issue across the city, but the situation here for the residents of downtown Los Angeles, my friends, the residents, the 65,000 residents, the, play, the people that call downtown home. Can we stick to items one, two, and three, and then we'll go to your general public comment, if we can go ahead and just... Uh, is it okay if time? I stick for the, for, to, the, to the general comment? If you just comment? want to do general public comment, that's take, fine. I'll just take my... You is that okay with you? a little bit left. Thank you. Just, okay. Okay. My fellow Angelino who just spoke, spoke about victims. The people that live here, there's, a, there's an attitude and there's a, a persona that they're a bunch of privileged people that live in high luxury lofts and therefore boo-hoo, poor them, that they have to walk <coughs> through fecal matter, through people doing all kinds of, of obscene, terrible things. My four children walk every single day and they hide behind me and my wife because they are afraid because they are accosted multiple times a day. Multiple times a day. This is the second largest city in the country. This is a place, this is, downtown has the tremendous potential. It's the crown jewel of the country. And yet every single day, every single day that's being squandered and it's getting worse and it's getting worse and it's getting worse. My friends, this cannot continue. This has to be stopped. Thank you. Can we uh, please read item number one to the record? Item number one is the Housing and Community Investment Department report relative to the authorization to issue funding commitments for the Proposition HHH Permanent Supportive Housing Loan Program. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and take the single uh, public comment cards at this time. We have uh, Betsy Starman. Is that the right one? Jed, no. Jed Perry. Excuse me, Jed Perriot. William Tavelli uh, and Mary Shepard. The one minute. Got it. Okay, so Jed. So you get. Okay, so you had multiple. You had multiple uh, comments. Okay, so you'll get your two minutes on items. What did he sign up for? Oh, I'm sorry. So one, two, and three. Apologies Great. for missing you. So items one, two, and three, you get two minutes and then one minute Great. for general public comment. And then the balance, you'll each have your one minute. So go ahead, Jed. Great. Hi there. Uh, Jed Perry with the Democratic Socialists of America. As you guys know, we are uh, out monitoring the police and sanitation sweeps across the city um, to hold our city workers accountable. <clears throat> um, but before I get to that, uh, when we're talking about HHH and LASA as the first two agenda items, I wanted to go back to something Councilmember Bonin mentioned at the last meeting. He suggested that the DSA and LA can form a nonprofit to provide services across the city. 
That's your job, Councilmember Bonin. Uh, we don't have millions of dollars at our disposal. And if you're going to ask the private sector to do these things, why don't you ask billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and people like that if they want to maybe spare a billion or two of their dollars, as they could. But no, that's not the society that we live in right now. So as we are talking about uh, sanitation later on, they will give a presentation and say how great things are going. Um, the facts uh, show otherwise. Do these sweeps really do anything to address this homelessness issue? Do they do anything? No, they do not. They actually make it much worse. It actually makes the problem so much worse. The sweeps uh, uh, that happen on a weekly, daily basis, uh, they claim that they will give people uh, uh, plenty of notice with loss of workers, outreach. They do not give notice. We talk to folks all the time that say they just showed up or they posted a sign over here and all of a sudden all my belongings are getting thrown out. All of a sudden I'm getting thrown up against a wall and handcuffed. This happens on a daily basis, handcuffing people for being homeless. No reason given. No reason given. Um, we have people, we have working class families homeless right now in Koreatown, an example. Just this week, folks waited, they, they saw that there was a sweep coming, they packed their belongings and waited for sanitation to come. We want them to come and clean. We would love for them to clean. They don't show up. But maybe the next day they show up. And then it's up against the wall. It's everything's in the trash. You had notice. This is disgraceful. These people need to be treated with dignity. Their Angelinos, you work for them too. And we will continue to watch and hold accountable. And as I have a minute left, I will continue here. So um, as we watch these uh, sweeps happen, as we record them, we have many documented on video and interviews with police officers and other city workers. Um, the unhoused residents come up and talk to us every time and say, thank you so much for being here because if you're not here doing this, they act completely different. They make fun of us. They give us way less time to gather our things. They put handcuffs on us. When we show up, they're on their best behavior. And one man even said, they would have thrown my bike out if you weren't here. Thank you so much. This officer who's acting nice is a horrible person to us every time. So please, when they, when they come up here today and tell you that they're so sensitive and that they're really doing this sweet social worker job out there, they're just not. It's just not happening. And, and to think that this is a proper use of our taxpayer dollars, to think that this is solving anything, and now you're going to give tens of millions more today to do this same, this same song and dance, something different has to happen. Mr. Tavelli? Yes, I'm here to speak on behalf of Step Up on 2nd Street. I was a homeless veteran for a while, and they're trying to get funds to support some more building conversions there at the Veterans Administration is working in conjunction with them, and they need the money to do that. They've already gotten a lot of veterans off the street and out of being homelessness, but they need more help. It is a system that is working. It does go for it. And the veterans do appreciate it, and they are off the street, and they are functional, and they are not a, uh, a liability to society now. They well, may not be an asset, but they're not causing any problems. They're happy. They got a place to eat, a place to sleep, cook their own food, do their own laundry, take their own shower or toilets and everything. And, and there, there's two more buildings in limbo because they don't have the funds because somewhere, somehow, their feet are getting drugged along to get the the process going. And I think it would be in the city of Los Angeles best interest to go ahead and fund this program because it would probably be less expensive through the city to do it that way because they've already got the knowledge and the ability and they have the buildings that just have to be refurbished to take this goal through. And Thank that would you. be my opinion on that. They've uh, done wonders for me. Thank you. You're, you're, you're past your time. I appreciate oh, it. Okay, Thank sorry. you so much. Ms. Shepard. That's all. <laughs> yes. Step up. We'll get it done. We're going to go to work on it. I'm here. <laughs> I am one of the veterans who live on the VA campus in the new oh. renovated uh, oh, wow. projects. I'm here for Step Up. We need funding. A year ago, I was homeless. I now have a roof over my head and the ability to live my life like a normal person. Step Up needs funding. There are two buildings on that campus that they can bring up to par inside of a year. 
there were 54 of us that went into those units. Mm. That's space for another 100 plus veterans that you can take off the street. It is hard being a veteran, being a homeless person. It is worse when you are a veteran and you have served this country and you cannot find housing. Please release the funds to this organization so they can help the rest of the veterans in this area. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, first of all, I want to be clear that I'm not with any, like, um, groups of activists or anything Could you like start that? with your name? Huh? Could you start oh, with Betsy your name? Oh, Betsy Starman. One I'm more not, time? Betsy Starman. That is my last name. Okay. Did we call you? Yeah. Well, I would think so. Item two? Okay. That would be why I'm sitting right. here. Can I get my time back? Yes, please give her her time back. All right. Um, so I'm Betsy Starman still. And I'm <laughs> making clear, though, that you know that I'm not like some kind of paid activist from Skid Row that wants to keep people oppressed so I can act like I fix them and be the big hero. I'm just a single person that speaks my own truth. I got no affiliation with anybody. And I appreciate the revision in the gravely disabled definition, and I know that that might result in possibly more 5150s. However, those 5150s will be more in count, and, but there will be no more services. It'll be the same thing. They're held for eight hours and let back out. So it's just a change in definition. And one thing that's important, Mitchell Settlement, please do not use, do not change the boundaries to encompass my neighborhood as a bargaining chip for that settlement. I live in the historic core. I'm a homeowner. Unless you want to pay me the difference in what I can sell my place for now and what it would sell for if you change the boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Todd Lipka, Asia Flowers, Willie, and Monty Williams. <laughs> Thank you, City Council members. I'm here speaking on behalf of the four projects put forth for uh, homeless veterans that uh, Step Up and our development partners have submitted. Uh, I know we've worked closely with HCID on trying to work out the issues. I think it's really important to get to yes here, and I hope we're at yes today. You know, we've been dialogue with them for weeks to address their uh, continuing questions about some of the details of the project. But the fact of the matter is this is almost 300 units of housing for chronically homeless veterans. In Building 209, we're targeting a very vulnerable veteran population. Three veterans since June, when we opened up, have already passed away. So it's very important that these projects move forward on this first round, the two motels and the two VA projects, because we're really talking about life and death for homeless veterans. If these get delayed by months, that's more veterans who are going to die on the street because they don't have housing. Housing, we know, is the foundation for recovery and uh, reintegration in our community. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth. I, I think we've come to resolving the issues, but we better because veterans' lives are at risk. Thank you. So your name. Start with your name. Oh, excuse me. My name is Monty Williams, Vietnam era veteran. I'm a Kirk Tell behind uh, Mr. Todd Lipkin, who I am very proud to know. I'm also speaking on the same issues that Todd is speaking on, which is I was one of the fortunate veterans to get into 209. Again, there's a lot of veterans left out there, veterans in, in uh, the Santa Monica area that are homeless and didn't get blessed like I was and had to, uh, some that, that Todd mentioned have passed away and I watched those veterans pass. You know, I'm, I'm really, really hope that you guys hear me this time. I spoke here before. Mm. This, this is a big project. There's other veterans out there who are at risk who would have health problems and mental health issues. And a lot of it could be addressed if, in time, uh, put into homes where they're, they're on that VA ground. So I highly encourage the panel to, to uh, really, really do what you can to support this program. Thank you. Got Kendall Walker and Yolita Dines coming up. You should start. Good afternoon. My name is Asia Flowers, and I'm here with Creed LA. The city has an opportunity to stand strongly in support of its veterans. The proposed housing will be permanent, safe, and affordable. The use of motels, vacant buildings, and the proposed 
uh, proposal to put veteran housing on the VA campus is the perfect location for the facility and the goals of the mayor as well as advocates of homeless housing. These proposed projects have the added benefit of already being shovel ready. They're, they are rehabilitations of existing structures rather than forming new construction. We need the housing now and we need to support these projects. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Willie. I'm one of the veterans that live in 209. I was homeless for 10 years. I'm glad I have an opportunity to have a spot now. Medication. It does. A lot of veterans don't leave the, the property. They stay there. They live in their house. They really ain't no harm to society. And there is a lot of mil mental illness with veterans. That's a lot of problems with us. I don't know what causes it, but a lot of us have it. Even me, believe it or not. So, and step up, give me the opportunity to get in there, and I love it. I mean, it's up to us to take it from there. And that's all I got to say, but they do need more housing for veterans. Thank you. We have uh, Yolita Dines. Okay, I'm Kendall Walker, <laughs> president of Figueroa Economical Housing Development Corporation. Uh, we've developed 13 properties throughout Los Angeles, and we are an affiliate of Figueroa Church of Christ who have uh, who feeds and who has fed and clothed the homeless in the Figueroa Corridor uh, since the early 90s. Um, Figueroa Economical Housing Development Corporation has partnered with Step Up on Second and Shangri-La Construction to complete this endeavor. Um, this endeavor, of course, consists of the four buildings that we've all heard of, uh, two uh, on the VA, uh, the VA properties 205 and 208. Uh, there were questions, and all the questions that were proposed have been answered. Um, of course, there is a unit cost of $450,000, which is in line with many of your new developments. The higher cost to do the, uh, the, the higher cost has to do with uh, the historic aspects and the reuse converting the housing. Also, I'd like to uh, briefly mention that the motels that we're also working with um, gives us that need for speed. We can actually deliver, deliver these motels in, uh, by the end of the year. We just need your assistance. Great. Um, Thank you. That's Thank you. I appreciate it. Good afternoon. My name is Yolita Dines. I'm here with Creed LA. And as you know, the mayor and the council have made solving the homeless problem a priority. Um, these projects proposed by Step Up and Shangri-La will provide, as they mentioned earlier, 346 units towards that goal. So not only um, are they proposing to help our homeless problem, but they are taking an, addi an additional step in targeting homeless veterans for the fastest possible housing solution. Also, these are projects that will be used, um, that will utilize skilled and local workforce. A lot of these um, organizations have received a lot of accolades in Sacramento for hiring the most veterans um, in, in these trades. Um, so this is basically the best of both worlds, and um, this is what HHH is intended to be used for. So please... Um, we shouldn't be stalling. Let's not have red tape. There is a homeless crisis in Los Angeles, and this is what we need from, from our city right now. The commitment needs to be made to veterans now. Thank you. Thank you so much. That concludes our uh, public comment for item number one. Uh, we have um, staff from our, our housing uh, department that will come and enlighten us further on these proposals. Uh, my name is Marquis harris -Doss. I'm the chair of this committee. I thank the vice chair. Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez for getting us going. Uh, in my tardiness, we've also been joined by Councilmember Kern Price, uh, Bonin, and uh, Wizar. Yes. Good afternoon, Chairman Harris Dawson, uh, members of the committee. My name is Sean Spear. I'm the Assistant General Manager for Housing Development with the Housing and Community Investment Department. Uh, we are. I'm, I'm joined by Tim Elliott, our uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund Manager. And uh, we are pleased to. <laughs> Sorry. We are pleased to uh, bring forward a uh, recommendation to approve another ten more projects for the HHH prog program, as well as to um, uh, present a, uh, an, a revision to our recommendation to include an additional four projects that um, I think we may have some discussion about. Um, the. Can you just name them so that the audience knows? Sure. So uh, they represent uh, two properties on the VA campus, uh, buildings 205 and 208, uh, as well as the uh, uh, West Third Street apartments. Uh, and uh, lastly, I'm located in uh, CD1. And uh, lastly, the the Bronco Motel, the Bronco Motel uh, which is located in CD8. Uh, so the uh, 
the proposal to update our recommendations to include those projects uh, with certain conditions uh, is uh, supported by the mayor and uh, by the department as a whole. Uh, we are looking forward to being able to uh, move these projects forward through their development process and onward to construction and eventually uh, providing the additional uh, supportive housing units that we desperately need here in the city. Uh, main thing I want to say also in addition is just, you know, to thank you all for your support in both our um, previous uh, approvals of deals uh, and our, in your guidance overall in terms of uh, providing a policy background for our HHH program. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tim in a second, but uh, really want to emphasize that, you know, the department takes very seriously its role in uh, attempting to meet the needs of the homeless population in the city and working with your guidance to be able to move forward our programs and the projects that come along. Main thing is that um, we attempt to be good custodians of the funds that are uh, provided to us by the by the citizens of the city and to make sure that we are supportive of those projects that can have the best chance to, to deliver the units that, as intended. Uh, I think going forward we are um, we have currently out right now a call for projects for uh, and another round of uh, applications. We're expecting perhaps at least a half dozen or more uh, to come through that. Uh, those projects, along with these projects you're being considered today, would be incorporated into uh, the PEP that would uh, uh, allow for us to uh, submit a, or receive additional bond uh, allocation that would be needed to use to fund the projects themselves. Um, main thing out of this group, I think, and out of the group as of 23 applications that we received originally uh, back on December 22nd, uh, we were pleased to not only see uh, existing developers that are familiar with uh, supportive housing and the, and the work to uh, make those deals happen, but also both new developers coming forward, um, both big and small. Uh, we had projects that were as little as five units come in and as large as 137. Uh, I think also we saw uh, developers who we had not seen in a long time um, basically coming forward with ideas about uh, ways to uh, create new supportive housing for our city. So going forward, we are um, really excited about being able to play a meaningful role in this work and to uh, continue to, do, um, to move forward projects as they come forward to us. Uh, Tim's going to take a few minutes to just go through some details on the applications and uh, the projects that we're recommending today. So the, the first 10 projects that um, we're recommending uh, would uh, receive $100 million in HHH funding. So the first 10 projects would uh, receive a, um, $100 million in, in HHH funding. And in, included in the, the capital stack of these projects is the uh, city's land value with uh, uh, $15 million. Um, and these projects are uh, uh, scattered throughout throughout uh, the town from almost in Inglewood to almost in Burbank. Um, and uh, we, we built in some incentives to, uh, to uh, locate projects in what HUD considers difficult to develop areas. Those are the, your, your higher opportunity areas. And um, uh, um, two of the 10 would meet that uh, category and uh, the projects on the VA campus would add to that. So altogether four projects in, in what we consider high opportunity areas out of um, out of 14. Uh, and uh, in addition to uh, the, uh, the, the value of the city owned land, uh, at least one of the projects is being built with uh, some alternative um, technology. Uh, it's, we're, we're the, the, the lowest cost project in the, in the whole uh, batch is, is actually being built out of shipping containers on Imperial Boulevard. Uh, and it's also a city owned site. So, um, if you factor out the city land, it's down under $400,000, which is, you know, much less than some of the others that we're seeing. Um, and uh, of the, the projects that we, the, the, the ones on the VA campus, there was some current concerns about the high cost, but, you know, we, we had to back out the, the extraordinarily high value of the land in, in Westwood and, and um, uh, the unusual nature of the buildings themselves. They have way more... Uh, common space than you would have in a in a normal apartment building, but it all it all needs to be furnished uh, and, and finished. And so when you back that out, we're at about the same cost of a, a new construction project. And we understand that historic rehab sometimes costs more than new construction, um, but I think we're on par with. They are not outliers, and those was one of the questions that we had and has been answered. So. 
Maybe just to add very quickly to that part, um, I think the I appreciate the um, the patience in working through the process that the developer in those cases uh, showed. Um, they were. Uh, throughout the process responsive to our questions related to their project and in addressing some of the um, the items in the application that um, did were not complete. Uh, that being said, I think there are a couple items that we feel very comfortable that we'll be able to work through in the, in the next several weeks to be able to get them ready to apply for uh, funding with the state. Excellent. Uh, questions, uh, colleagues? Mr. Price? Thank you. I've, um I'm excited that we're moving forward. I mean, this is a, an important, uh, an important day, and an important milestone. Uh, and I just want to applaud, applaud my colleagues for stepping up. Thank you, stepping up to the plate. Uh, and um, uh, taking uh, taking responsibility, as we want all of our our, our colleagues to do. Uh, I have projects in my district that have been waiting to, for a green light for five years. Five years. Oh, these are. Two of these are old CRA projects. Uh, they've been sitting vacant uh, when they could be providing much needed housing. And uh, although other sources of funding have dried up over the years, we now have HHH um, to help move these projects forward. And I think we should be moving them forward as quickly, as quickly as possible. Uh, it's plain and simple. Uh, as stated in today's paper, we can't let the bureaucratic red tape stop these projects from moving forward and from moving our, uh, these programs forward. We need to get shovels in the ground as quickly as possible, Mr. Chairman. So I certainly support the recommendations that have been presented. And I also would move that we amend the staff report to recommend that both the residences on Maine and Casi Roses be allocated the full amount of $220,000 per door if they are unable to obtain financing to close the gap by the time the sale of bonds is expected to move forward this summer. Uh, again, these are two projects on city-owned land uh, that I think uh, deserve to move forward with the kind of uh, uh, speed and, uh, and certainty that will make everyone very proud. Thank you, Mr. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Wizar? Quick question on one of the projects that's being proposed, the Meta Housing Project. It, it, it stands out, it, it has a very high total development cost, about 679000 per unit, but yet its HHH cost is very low, like 100,000 unit, 100,000 per unit. How, why that difference, or how, how do we explain that? Well, that that project is uh, actually being built on the um, the headquarters of the existing county uh, parks and recs department. So the lands, um, the land value, it's right on Vermont and in in um, like Sixth Street. So it's uh, in Koreatown. So the value of land is included in that in that figure, even though it's not being paid for. Um, and, and there's a 12,000-square-foot uh, YMCA on the bottom floor, which is also in, in that budget but isn't being paid for out of the residential sources. But it, does, it is eligible for federal tax credits, so, so it's included in the budget. So when you back, it's the same as, the, as building 208. If you back out those extraordinary costs that we're not really paying for, they're, they're both within, uh, they're both about $450,000 a door. Okay, but so the total cost you're including now the other the property that otherwise would have been is free, but otherwise there's a value to it. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Um, no, I just uh, you know Councilman Price said it. Uh, since taking office, you know this project we've been working on Summit View, uh, working very closely with LA Family Housing to address, uh, you know a time when my district didn't have any representation, and so I'm excited that we're at a point where we're now moving forward. So I'm very excited about uh, getting ready to break ground on this, uh, on this project in the 7th District. So thank you for your work. Mr. Bonnet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, thank you folks uh, for the, the work. Thanks to all the veterans and the community members who came down today. Uh, I'd like to define moments, and I want to define the moment we're in. Because today, this morning, uh, a number of us stood together down the street uh, at a permanent supportive housing facility and then submitted a motion later that said, we're all going to try to approve 222 units of permanent supportive housing in each of our districts in the next three years. And this is a big step to do that. 
this, uh, just looking down this list, this has, I think, CDs 8, 10, 4, 13, 10, 2, 1, 11, 7, and 9. It's like 10 council districts right there getting a start. Um, I'm particularly glad we got 156 units in this package from CD11. Um, and, and I want to thank HCID staff for amending its recommendation to include uh, buildings 205 and 208 at the VA. Just so folks can hear that, the VA properties are included in their recommendation now. I want to just underscore that. Uh, and I and, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, I know it's been sort of tough getting to this place, and I want to acknowledge that your initial reluctance to say yes was not saying no. It was getting us to a better place. And I think we all have a better understanding now. The costs aren't what we were concerned they were uh, once you take out the, the value of the land, which the VA is giving free. Um, I want to give a little bit of context on the VA properties because uh, Mr. Price has been waiting five years. Uh, the veterans have been waiting at least five decades. <laughs> at least five decades. Uh, as long as I've been involved in public life, Bill Rosendahl, Bobby Shriver have been trying to get these three buildings uh, used. Uh, 209 already has folks in it, folks who are here today. Uh, and this has taken like forever. I was in D.C. in 2010 talking to White House senior staff lobbying for us to be able to use these buildings. And the, the VA went through under uh, uh, President number 44, Mr. Obama, uh, and his last VA secretary, Robert McDonald, who actually cared about this issue, they went through an EIR process that was taking <coughs> decades, literally decades, and ultimately, there's the potential to build close to 2,000 units of, of housing here. Uh, I never get the exact numbers right, but there's transitional in PSH, 1,000 and 800 or 800 and 1,000. And this is sort of the, the, the first step in that. Uh, it would be nice, it would be nice if the federal government stepped up and helped with more than letting us use the land that belongs to the veterans in the first place. Uh, but the city is, as it is in so many areas, stepping up where the federal government isn't and putting up the money to, to help these get done. Uh, so we, we are going to be doing this, uh, 205 and 208. Um, I, I'd like us, though, as, as part of this package to, uh, you know, this may be peeing in the wind a bit, but reach out to the, the VA and the federal government and see if there's any potential for them adding some funds to this. I'd also like us to ask, I mean, the, the rehab of these historic buildings is, is, is not inconsiderable. I wonder what the cost would be for future projects, because there's room for a hell of a lot more there, uh, from ground up construction, uh, and whether or not that's something mm -hmm. that we should be uh, investing in. The state should be investing in, uh, other private entities should be investing in. Because it's basically enhanced use leases that we can do there to get the housing. So if we could look into those two things, and I'm happy to assist with the right interest to the VA. Appreciate it. The other thing I just want to note for the record is um, the, the, the projects in my district. 20 years ago, and I said this this morning, so my apologies for repeating myself with Mr. Wezar and Mr. Harris Dawson, folks in Brentwood objected to these, objected to housing for homeless veterans on the VA campus. When this EIR was up a couple years ago, they came out and supported it. The Tom Saffron project in West LA, the Neighborhood Council voted 11 to 1 in favor of doing that. And that's why I'm really confident we're all going to be able to get to well over 222 um, in our districts. Uh, and. Um, with that, I want to just thank you again for including this and thank all the vets for all the work they've done to, uh, to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bonin, and um, I'm so grateful for the work that you all have done to, to bring us to this point and to, uh, for the enthusiasm of uh, not just our colleagues here on this committee, but our colleagues around the horseshoe uh, in uh, collectively putting our, our shoulder to the wheel and getting this done and getting it done together. 
Uh, I think it's one of the most progressive uh, things a city, a big city in this country uh, can and has done, uh, following up HHH with a commitment for ev from every part of the city to, to, to build housing. And this gets us, as Mr. Bonin says, a, a long way. Uh, particular questions about a couple of the, the projects in uh, uh, that you all asked to uh, have this measure amended with uh, in District 8. There's the um, infamous Bronco Motel. Uh, and there's another site that are sort of in abeyance. Uh, and I wondered if you all could talk about uh, how much of how much time we have uh, to get those figured out and, and what you think some of the barriers are. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the developer for the Bronco Motel uh, is um, hoping to submit applications to the state for taxes and bond authority along with tax credits uh, in mid-March. Um, part of the thing that is we'll need to continue to discuss are a couple items that will be threshold items for those programs as well. So we remain confident, though, that um, being able to address the issue, particularly around um, just proof of site control in the form of the actual purchase and sale agreement from the current owners of the project is needed. Um, those, the developer does have those in hand, they just didn't have ready access to them. Um, but we're hoping to get those next week. Uh, the other piece is uh, the appraisal for the property. Um, there were um, concerns from our appraisal reviewer, who was a third-party appraiser that we have hired on contract. Uh, they had some concerns about the methodology associated with the appraisal itself. So with your support, what we intend to do is actually provide that appraiser uh, with instructions from us as to exactly how they should do the methodology for that. We remain confident that it will probably take a couple weeks for them to go back to revise it, but hopefully in time for the application. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. And just, um, I know this is unconventional and may not be able to be quantified, but I, I ask everybody, considering that particular project, to uh, somewhere on some spreadsheet uh, count the cost to the city and the number of calls we get to, from LAPD to that particular address. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we'd save uh, if this project were to be converted. Uh, again, I know that's not a normal part of appraisals, but if, if uh, we can consider that somehow, some way, would be We can ideal. help the LAPD. We'd be happy to take that money, too, to help exactly. fund <laughs> that program. Because uh, a good deal gets spent there. Okay, so um, uh, we have before us uh, item number one with a couple of amendments. Uh, could you give us a score on where we are and, and what we're considering? Um, item one is approved as amended by... Uh, Council Member Price and Council Member Bonin. Okay. That's where we are at. And this includes the staff amendment? Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay. Good. Does that include my amendments? Yes. Mr. Price and. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. All right. So, uh, Mr. yes, sir. Let me just point out too the Casa project, Casa Rosa's project is a project for uh, female veterans with kids. Wow. So, again, it's an important uh, population that, uh, that we want to serve. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we have item one as amended before us. Yes, sir. Uh, number two. Is there a second? No, second. Second? Yes. Uh, hearing no objection, uh, that will be the order. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> item number two is uh, council motion uh, made by council member Weezer, Bonin, Blumenfield relative to an instruction to the city homeless coordinator with assistance from the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, the CLA, Housing and Community Investment Department, Fire Department, Building Safety, General Services Department, and City Attorney, and other appropriate departments to report with recommendations for expanding emergency shelter and crisis housing options to address the unsheltered population living on the streets of Skid Row. All right, thank you so much. We have a few speakers on this. I have a couple folks that have asked to speak on items two and three, so I'm going to give you two minutes together. Those are Blair Beston, Pat Barrett, Claudia Olive Oliveira, Liz Hirsch. Good afternoon, Council Members. Blair Besson, Executive Director of the Historic Core Business Improvement District, but I speak to you today as a resident and a single mother raising a five-year-old in um, basically an apartment complex in the boundaries of Skid Row. 
Um, we often hear about the great weather in Southern California, but as the last few days have demonstrated, um, LA and its bitter cold nights um, has them as well. Uh, it only takes one night to take a vulnerable person's life. We absolutely need to support more emergency shelter options. Sleeping on a sidewalk, um, in light of recent news uh, exposing the violence and gangs in Skid Row, uh, every night of homelessness there is an emergency. Um, we should carefully consider where we provide these new options and if it's our moral responsibility to provide them in safer areas and if by nature spreading them will create options to people, for people to sleep out of harm's way. Thank you. Um, item number three. Uh, the downtown area requires as much sanitation services and really any resources you're willing to give us, um, considering we were required to shelter, house, and provide services for the vast majority of the reason, region's homeless individuals. We really need to be thinking about how to alleviate the horrible conditions of Skid Row on a more regular basis as the public health issues are affecting all areas, but especially the areas um, most concentrated with enormous, burdensome, and growing encampments. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claudia Oliveira. I am a board director for Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council, and I am speaking in my private capacity. Um, for item two, I would like to say that I believe that expansion, first of all, I am very happy that you guys are devoting so much attention to this, and it, it is an emergency. And with that being said, um, expanding not just within this district, I think it's a very important thing, and even within the city. There was a gentleman that came to us from the city of El Monte. He has told us that he has thousands of beds available right now. He is with uh, the Federation, Federación de Cámaras de Comercio Colombianas. He doesn't speak any English, but in, in some way, shape, or form, it's people like that that I believe that we should devote time to communicating with. Um, that is it for item, item two. I would like to speak on item three. Um, well, I think there's a difference between the illegal dumping versus belongings, and that's where that there's a fine line, and I think that that makes it very hard for you guys to be able to clean the streets with when you have the, the ACLU lawsuit and, and all that. I do understand that there's a loophole when it comes to bulky items, but also there is a, n not enough personnel to determine what those items are. So I in order to decide what items can be removed, in order to be able to clean the streets, I would encourage devoting some funds um, probably, I, I, don't, I don't know how you guys would do that, but to the Bureau of Sanitations in order to determine, maybe come up with a list, refrigerator, bulky items, other things, personal items, I'm not sure. Um, but that will help LAPG to do its job and that will help you guys clean the streets. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name's Pat Barrett and I live in South Park and I'm here as a private resident. Um, speaking up, and I, I thank you very much for listening to us and having us here. We have to prioritize, this is what I feel, who we're going to house. First of all, the most important people that are affected are women and children. We need to duplicate Downtown Women's Center, which has a 95 to 98 percent success rate. They also have the second shelter was given by Jan Perry. Why can't we go to Jan Perry and ask her how we did that? You have over 9,000 city buildings. Why can't we allocate that to that? We also have to look at our veterans that want help. And after that, we also have to look at other people who want help and want to go into these shelters. And I have women at the downtown women's shelter. I have people that are older that I don't even have a number to give them to go for housing or anybody, and they're out in the streets. My second item that I wanted to speak up was cleaning up all the encampments, especially on Skid Row. I am hearing, and that needs to be done. They need to be cleaned up. I believe from it's from 10 to 6, but they need to be cleaned up, and then they can encamp again. These are drug problems. They are prostitution places that people go to. There's one girl that homeless. She went in there, one of them for food. They ended up raping her, taking off her clothes, and throwing her in the street dead. 
This is one example of many, and this was given to me by Downtown Women's Center. The other thing that I'd like to say in general, we are the largest homeless population in the world, in the country. We enable these people. We have cheaper drugs that we can get to, that people come to. And my understanding is the police cannot do their job because of the laws we enacted. We need to change this. City Council has voted 200, they get $200 million a year from the franchise, from the trash, franchises that Wazar and everybody else voted. Let's get that money, 200 to $300 million a year that they get on a monthly basis. Uh, that they get a certain amount every month. Hi, good afternoon, uh, council members. Thank you very much for uh, listening today. My name is Liz Hirsch. I live in Hollywood. I'm a mother and a teacher. I'm also a member of Democratic Socialists of America, um, so I believe housing is a human right. And I want to say regarding item two that I, of course, support repurposing city property to provide immediate shelter and amenities. I think that should happen um, right away, and I think it should happen aggressively. But beyond that, I think it would just be so good if you could propose something that's ambitious, truly ambitious. Los Angeles wants to host the Olympics? The Olympics? Why can't there just simply be some kind of space program of addressing house housing for the unhoused in this city that we can truly uh, get behind and understand as an actual solution? That brings me to item three. Because under 5611, what you do to the homeless is no solution at all. It further uh, exacerbates their issues. It puts them under extreme duress. And it gives your constituents this idea that something's happening, this idea that the visibility of homelessness is getting taken care of. Meanwhile, they're back days later, hours later. So people have a hotline they can call up. And you want, next fiscal year, $17 million. $17 million for the Board of Sanitation to continue to do this when you could be spending that money on housing, on shelter, on amenities. I just think that's unbelievable. And I think people in this room, by the way, who think that activists are compensated, it's a joke. It's a hilarious misconception. And I hope it worries you more to know that we're not. <laughs> Eric, Eric Rippon, Jan McCarthy, Robin Donio, Bill Watkins. Uh, hi, my name is Eric Ribbon. Um, I live in the historic core and I've been there, uh, I've been in downtown on and off for over a decade. Um, I'm, I'm alarmed at how I've seen the homelessness issue uh, become much worse in the last year or so. And um, I'm alarmed at the idea of expanding the boundaries of Skid Row uh, f uh, to further include the historic core and, and South Park. Um, I would like to see uh, more districts in the city uh, provide the homeless with care instead of having it so concentrated in downtown. I think that that would help to alleviate the crime that and having it so concentrated uh, uh, invites. And um, that's about it. Just please decentralize. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jan McCarthy. I've been here since 2006. I live in the historic core. I've seen the homeless population grow um, exponentially, and I think that it is naive and irresponsible of you all to take um, just thinking that you can put a Band-Aid on and expand uh, the Skid Row to encompass areas in downtown that, on the other hand, you're trying to promote and invite people in. As someone who's been a victim of um, violent assault, um, it concerns me a lot that I feel very unsafe walking around downtown and witnessing um, not only sexual acts, but 
uh, drug uh, interactions and um, violence constantly. And I think that you all just need to put more planning and thought. I definitely think that the homeless deserve attention um, and they deserve some sort of help. But it just saying let's just expand it and take it into the historic core area and other areas that are concentrated, um, it should be Thank looked you. at other options. Thank you. That's your time. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Robin Doino. I'm with the Mar Vista Community Council and the Homeless Solutions Committee. First off, I'd like to ask you to replace uh, Elisa Ardunias just as soon as possible. Uh, a coordination is of utmost importance, even on a temporary basis, month to month, uh, somebody to fill that spot. I think uh, the crisis calls for that. Uh, secondly, because of the federal emphasis on the permanent supportive housing, which is wise, I think LA needs to take great effort at the humane augmentation efforts. Uh, we've seen a lot of them. Uh, the community supports them, uh, just so they're not near my house, of course. Uh, the uh, concept of, of caring is part of our nature, and we support council doing just that. Thank you. Hello, uh, for two, three, and general. Is that on the right now with right one minute? Now you have one minute for item. For two, two and three. I'm signed up for two, three, and general. So You have one minute. For what? For item three. Two, two sorry. Time back for two. I'm doing two, three, and general. I have, I, have diff I have a different time for each one. It's not clear. I just want to make that comment. My name is Bill Watkins, formerly homeless. I recommend quickly, I recommend day labor posts and jobs. Day labor posts and jobs. That's what we need. I'm formerly homeless. I could use one myself. I would show up at 8 o'clock on a lineup, sign a one-day co contract for 85 bucks to clean our sidewalks and streets. Please consider this. I would talk to my Councilman, his office doesn't call me. That becomes an ethics violation. So please be advised. Okay, it's been many weeks. Um, so I guess I'll wait on three in general. Go ahead. Do your three. Okay. Thank you, sir. Get me on the bus sooner. Appreciate it. So uh, thanks so much. Bill Watkins, alcoholic, formerly homeless, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, UC Santa Barbara. School didn't work for me. It was a false god. It just didn't, uh, the college wasn't what it was cracked up to be. Oh, I mention it because as you make 200 grand a year, you guys, and you might think you need to send your kids to college, you don't. Just teach them a trade. Just teach them a trade and, and be a nice person. And give the money back to the city. Give it, give it back to us to clean our gutters, sidewalks, and I'm going to say storm drains. I say it a lot because they're clogged. I work 1 in 14. I work districts 1 in 14 for free. I clean these out because my books don't sell yet. They will someday, hopefully, my screenplays. Um, but, for, but also, I'm, I'm, I care about the city. Uh, I have a Native American part of me that likes the great spirit and wants to ask God back. And we can't do that with a dirty, disgusting city. There's trash everywhere. That's not just LA, though. That's nationwide. Go to St. Louis. Go, go, go anywhere. We don't have that problem solved because we've gotten addicted to cars and trucks. We think we can truck everywhere or have a machine for everything. My name is Bill Watkins, alcoholic. I take a broom a bib, and a dustpan, and I do wonders. Tomorrow I'll be in Highland Park, God willing, on Avenue 60. Mr. Cedillo is advised, and his staff actually has called me back, Jose, and I sure uh, hope that can start to happen with your office. Uh, no, the number two on our code of ethics in the city of Los Angeles refers to impartiality, and it refers to public trust. Uh, we need to have trust in you guys uh, in response uh, to have an ethical relationship um, and I ask you to please, as I go away, think about day labor posts, think about 200 grand a year, and maybe thinking about giving me 20 grand to clean your sidewalks. Thank you. Still got five the, seconds. The um, clerk uh, has indicated that there's some problem with our technology here, so I apologize uh, to you for not correctly uh, okay. assessing how many cards you'd submitted. Tell us all Cecilia the, the game Nahar. plan, as it might help. Tell us at the top what the game plan is, then we'll all know. That's the coach. 
Hi, my name is Cecilia Nahar. I'm a resident of downtown Los Angeles. And first, I want to commend you for your fair share approach to uh, permanent supportive housing, 222. Three years, great start. But we need to have that same fair share approach to shelter and services. And you probably already know we should start building like 35,000 shelter beds because we're on the road to New York City. We're on that road already. And we have to acknowledge it. Um, now, with regard to shelter and services in Skid Row, no more. Andy Bales, if you ask Andy Bales at Union Rescue Mission, he'll say it's almost impossible to get mental health, mentally well or clean in Skid Row. And NBC and Univision just showed us why. Dealers in front of recovery centers, tents full of guns and drugs, women raped and trafficked, daily assaults, stabbings. It's inhumane and irresponsible. If you are mentally ill or have a drug addiction problem, you will not survive. And if you don't, you will get one and not survive. So um, go back to your fair share approach. Create fair share shelters and services throughout every city, council district, every county district. And also, LA River has a lot of county land that could be used for shelter right now. Right now. Thank and you. Thank you. That's your time. <laughs> All right, we have uh, staff representatives from a number of departments to speak to this matter. Will be led by our homelessness czar. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I? Um, this is item two, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Can I start it off on on that? Sure. And then ask because uh, this is uh, a report back that we're getting back, mm -hmm. and so we, uh, as we all know, we have the largest concentration of homeless individuals in Skid Row in the country, and every night we have about 2,000 individuals that sleep on the streets because we do not have enough shelter beds. Uh, what we have done recently at a Pueblo, I think, could be replicated and scaled up for Skid Row, which is ground zero for our homeless um, population, not only in the city, in the county, but in the country. At a Pueblo, we have taken a city parking lot. Uh, we will have 60 to 70 uh, people go through, have shelter, have services, uh, and hopefully get on a, a path to recovery. Now, we hope that this would alleviate some of the uh, homeless population that has been increasing around El Pueblo. Um, in the last couple of years, and we will target those individuals who are around a Pueblo, so we have a population that we want to serve. After seeing what we're doing there, I thought that we could actually replicate that at Skid Row, and just uh, and we're asking staff to find available public, uh, publicly owned land uh, to see what it would cost, and, and and use a Pueblo as a model to do it in Skid Row and house those 2,000 individuals who are sleeping on the streets each night. Now, we know that we are working towards decentralization. Uh, we want to provide services throughout the city, but we cannot ignore the inhumane conditions we have in Skid Row, and we have to start addressing those immediately. And this triage-type approach, I think, is a way to move forward. So we're looking forward to uh, getting a report back on seeing uh, what we can do there. Now, we've talked earlier about we just approved some measure HHH projects, and we are looking to decentralize. That's part of implementing our comprehensive strategic plan. Um, but those are long-term. We've started off, I think rightly so, as a city, on implementing our comp comprehensive strategic plan and doing long-term planning, because that's something that we failed to do decades past, and we're doing that now. But the more immediate stuff I think we need to do, and hopefully um, with the report that we get back from the departments, we could be in line with the budget discussions we're having to see if we could um, put some of that, uh, uh, um, allocate some funding through our budget to some of these reports we get back. So we're looking forward to getting those, those reports. And just wanted to kind of um, thank you. talk a little bit initially about the um, uh, initial uh, thoughts behind this motion. So thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Councilman. Meg Barkley, City Homeless Coordinator in the CAO's office. Um, so yes, in response to the motion, we can work with the departments identified, especially LASA, to I, to get a complete inventory of the beds that are available in in the Skid Row area, but also um, to look at what and how you might calculate what the need what 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 the need for established beds is according to to that to that population, as well as um, in response to another um, motion that uh, you introduced there's we are working with a in a working group with a number of city departments including um, LASA the Bureau of Engineering building and safety fire 
I'm sure GSD procurement and construction um, using this as an example but also um, preparing some recommendations to take advantage of new state law that would allow us to streamline some of our building and um, code requirements as it relates to um, responses to a declared shelter emergency which would allow us to establish a process for um, establishing shelter more quickly according to these alternate standards and using thing, other types of construction, uh, modular construction as, as is being implemented on, on El Pueblo, but then other things, large tension membrane structures similar to what they're doing in San Diego. We've been doing a lot of different research on that, on those options, which would also feed into whatever is decided as a result of this, of the report back. Okay. Two things. Um, how quickly do you think we could get the report back? That is an excellent question. Um, I'd say we could we could shoot for 45 days would probably be realistic given the amount of um, of analysis and, um, and especially the the question of identifying property that might take some time. Great, thank you. And, and uh, again, I think uh, the approach to Skid Row when you have such a concentrated um, number of homeless individuals or people experiencing homelessness, it needs a triage type immediate response that I don't think the city has approached in that way and it's, it's about time that we move direct like that. I've always thought, you know, if there's a disaster someplace in the country, we get FEMA in there and they come in with additional resources and um, And it just seems like that's the type of approach I thought we should take as a city. Thankfully, now that there's so much attention, well, it's unfortunate because now homelessness is everywhere and there's a lot more attention being put on homeless and uh, the, the homeless crisis. And it's about time that we no longer ignore this and just, we've, got, we've become accustomed to it. But let me tell you, the people who live in downtown, work in downtown and visit downtown, haven't gotten accustomed to it because at the end of the day, it's, it's, they're the ones living with it each and every day and they feel it, they see it. And, um, it's just unfortunate we allowed it to get to this place. So thank you. We've done some back of the envelope uh, estimates as to how much something like this would cost to house mm -hmm. 2,000 individuals who sleep on the street. We came up with about $20 million, mm -hmm. but that is based upon the Pueblo mo uh, model, and we didn't calibrate it in any which way. We just said, okay, we're housing 60 to 70 every six months right. per year, about 120, 140 per year, uh, and... Um, that includes the shelter, the trailers, the services, the bathrooms, the showers, everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and we came up with 20 million, but we look forward to seeing how much this would cost. I think at the end of the day, we announced, we announced a few years ago that we're going to put additional $100 million into homelessness. You know, if we're doing that, we could probably have some money. We could look at those funds or anything else. Um, that'll be the next step we would ask is if we do come up with a cost, then mm -hmm. to also possibly identify some funding sources in the budget that where we could do this. Thank you very much. Mr. Bonin. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Wiesar for this motion. Uh, I, I loved it so much when I saw it uh, that yesterday Mr. Harris Dawson and I basically said, let's do this for the entire city, not just for Skid Row. Um, 45 days, man. I, I know this is hard, but... Um, you, you nailed it when you said FEMA. I mean, if we hadn't, er, um, the Skirball fire, people hadn't even left their homes, and I was standing with Mr. Koretz and, and, and uh, Chief Terrasas, uh, as, as you were, Ms. Rodriguez, out in, in the fires in your district saying, here's where the shelters are. Mm -hmm. I mean, within like an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we're, we're stuck in the situation where we have encampments everywhere and um, you know the next item we're going to be talking about sanitation and cleanups and then we're going to hear a request for millions more in, in, in cleanups in, in, an, in another item in, in a few weeks or so and we're we have chosen as a city to tell people to sleep on sidewalks mm -hmm. I mean nobody ever said here's the city policy uh, and it probably wasn't entirely intentional, but it was evident that it was going to happen back 10, 12 years ago, whenever it was, when we had the Jones suit, and we made the settlement, and we said we'll allow people to sleep on the sidewalks until we provide housing and shelter, because the courts have said it's cruel and unusual punishment not to. 
And then we didn't provide the housing and shelter. So, of course, we have encampments everywhere. I mean, we, we literally, that, that is the de facto policy of the city of Los Angeles is live on the sidewalks. We actually had a lawsuit in, in, in Venice, uh, either right before or right after I took office, about vehicular living. And in one case, an officer said, get out of your car, where can I sleep? On the sidewalk. Um, we have to start providing, and it's a dirty word in a lot of homeless segments, I know, more shelter beds. Mm -hmm. Call them crisis housing, call them bridge housing, call them interim, transitional, call them shelter. I don't care what you call them, but right. uh, we, we shouldn't be considering another $17 million for cleanups until we've looked at how much of that we need to actually get people out of encampments. Instead of cleaning up encampments, we want to get rid of encampments. Uh, thank you, but yeah. don't applaud until we actually get this fixed. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I think th this is great. Uh, we, we need, we can have a perfect plan in 45 days where we know all the locations, but we, we need to have something sooner. That we, we need to do the 222 press conference mm -hmm. with 18 elected officials saying, okay, we know we need to have these many crisis beds. We need to have these many, and we're going to do six in this district and six in this district, whatever it is, but we need to know the, the math and the cost and the scale so we can do it because I've, I've ranted in this committee again and again that it that we were supposed to in the comprehensive homelessness strategy 7a we were supposed to be increasing the number of shelter beds and changing them into more welcoming centers 24 hours a day accommodating pets and spouses and belongings and all that and that hasn't happened and what's disturbed me most is we haven't I, I haven't seen anywhere a, a game plan for how to do that. Like, I don't know that we have a goal of how many by the end of the year, and we have to. No. We, we, we have to. So um, thank you for, for, for kicking this, Mr. Wiesar. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And we all have to keep kicking it. So I, 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 will, I didn't want to make a promise that I couldn't keep on the timeline, and so um, I wanted to be able to come back to you when I said I could come, when I said we could come back to you, we'll make every effort to make it quicker than that. But I just I didn't want to make a commitment that would be that I would be late. So again, I know you can't get every department to, to just immediately do stuff. I mean, uh, let's we'll we'll convene the meeting if we have to to get them to answer you <laughs> yeah. like this week. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, happy. Yeah. To. I have a I already have a I already have a time scheduled with with Lassa to discuss this, and so we'll. If, it, if we run into that, believe me, I'll take you up on it. Excellent. If there's no uh, further questions or comments, we'll adopt this uh, motion. Hearing no objection, that'll be the order. It moves us to item number three. Item number three. Thank you. Item number three is a public works bureau sanitation report relative to the livability and environmental quality program, legal dumping, and homelessness encampment cleanups. This item is also referred to the Energy, Climate Change, and Environmental Justice and Public Safety Committees. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have a number of public comment speakers. We have uh, Amara, David, Quattrochi, excuse me if I missed that one, Estela Lopez, Cecilia Nahar, Whoever makes it to the mic first can start. Just say your name. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Estella Lopez. I'm the director of the Industrial District BID. Our borders cover about 85% of Skid Row. Um, I'm here primarily to thank the Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, incredible men and women doing an impossible task with insufficient resources. Um, even with the work that they do um, and the work that our bid maintenance people do, um, the Bureau of Sanitation, Operation Healthy Streets, and all the other programs, I have to tell you, they are the thinnest firewall between downtown L.A. and a public health epidemic. 
keep funding them. Do all the things that you were going to do regarding housing and shelter. But do not reduce, in fact, I beg you, to increase the resources to the Bureau of Sanitation. If not, the, the headlines will not be only about people living on the sidewalk. It will be about people and business owners and property owners succumbing to an epidemic. Thank you. My name is Amara Onlibu, and I sit here as a resident of the Historic Core and a business owner. And I cannot agree more with the council members' earlier comments about uh, what we should be using these funds for. And I also sit here torn because we are indeed in a crisis, but it is a crisis of historic poor decisions. As a city, we gave up on people a long time ago when we allowed them to live on the street. And irresponsible activists have asked them to call that freedom. And now we are asked to respond to the inhumane conditions that the city has allowed. Every day I have to walk across an alley um, to the building that I reside in, Historic Core, and I walk across a disgusting assortment of discarded items, carelessly discarded items. And those are people who are housed. So we indeed need resources. I implore you for them. But I also want you to consider what the use of those funds should, could be for other than cleanups for encampments. Can we get people into housing so that we don't have to deal with encampments in the first place? Thank you. Hi, I'm David Quattrochi. I'm here as a citizen of uh, Los Angeles, a resident of Silver Lake. I also uh, represent uh, Democratic Socialists of America, uh, the Los Angeles branch. Um, Councilmember Bonin, I think the response, the clapping is not so much uh, funneling to you, uh, but the ideas that you are talking about actually addressing the problem of homelessness, why it's happened, why people are living on the street, and not can we sweep the problem further down the road, which is a phrase you've heard a lot. I am one of the people who have interacted with people in these encampments and heard firsthand that these sweeps don't in fact do anything uh, in the way that these funds w uh, ostensibly will go towards. $17 million can be spent a lot better on housing. If you are adamant about the shelter thing, uh, I'm running out of time. I would advise you to interview uh, women and children who've been inside shelters before going down that path. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Cecilia Nahar. I'm a resident of downtown. Um, if the streets of downtown were, were measured for bacteria and disease, and we just put a Petri dish on what we walk on, we would be in a serious health emergency. Um, we are also unique in our density. Uh, the, the amount of um, people who rely on those really diseased streets full of fecal matter and, and, and trash and needles and uh, uh, hepatitis A and a strain of tuberculosis and, and God knows what else. Um, there's 120,000 of us who, who live there, work there, and we are unlike anything else in this city. The density is just so high. And if we did have an epidemic of any sort, the, the repercussions, it would decimate the homeless population, obviously. I mean, it would have massive stakes there. But you would also have massive stakes in the convention traffic, in the hotels, in the residents, and in the business. You Thank cannot you. let us let's flounder. Thank you. I have uh, Jonathan, Ryan Kelly, Rena Letty, and the inimitable Carol Schatz. <laughs> <laughs> Did you call him first? Yes. Thank you. My name is Ryan Kelly. I also organize with the Democratic Socialists of America. I've witnessed these sweeps firsthand in Northeast LA with no regard to the safety or survival of the unhoused people there, including elders and children 
sanitation workers threw vital possessions into a dump truck. Life-saving items like tents and sleeping bags were put into a garbage truck and compacted. A man taking his partner to a rehab appointment begged us to look after his belongings. They were destroyed. A man living with his 90-year-old mother on the street were displaced, their shelter destroyed. Sanitation workers are unaware of the laws they should be following, nor do they exhibit any human compunction or empathy for the, uh, for the fractured lives being further demolished. The idea of further funding an inhuman, inhumane, ineffective program is appalling. We should not criminalize human suffering. Rather, we should criminalize the institutions and structures that inflict that suffering. Hi, I'm Rena Letty with the Fashion District uh, Bid, and we are a bid that's adjacent to Skid Row, and I'm here to support the motion. Um, LA Sanitation has become invaluable to the success of our business community. We have, um, as of February 1st, at least 400 homeless individuals sleeping in our district, and we are um, calling the LA Sanitation um, Department on average 100 calls a week because of homeless encampment related issues, blocking alleys and sidewalks. Um, recently, one alley, ha you could not pick up any uh, trash from the dumpsters that were in the alley, you could not drive down it to get deliveries. 4,000 pounds of trash was picked up in that particular alley. It was one block long um, and 300 needles. That was three people in one alley, a block long. So we fully support any additional resources that you will be bringing to um, LA San, and we absolutely um, support resources for housing. Thank and you. I think we can do both. Carol Schatz, president of the Downtown Center BID. We strongly support this motion. Thank you, Council Member Wezar, for uh, bringing this in. Uh, we need to obviously put the resources where the need is greatest. That's just obvious. And we, all of us downtown, or most of us downtown, wish we were not the place that needs the resources the most, but we are. We also strongly support increasing the number of teams and personnel that are devoted to this, not only in downtown, but around the city. As you have heard, as you know, this is a health issue of unbelievable importance. We have built a miracle downtown, and it's an economic engine that now drives the whole city. Let's not let that engine sputter out because we're not taking care and keeping our streets clean and our residents and stakeholders healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have uh, Jonathan Shane Phillips, Shelby Lee, Michael Steinborn. <laughs> Anybody, just say your name and, All right. and roll. Uh, good afternoon. This is Shane Phillips. I'm Director of Public Policy for Central City Association. Um, uh, we've had a lot of comments today, so I'll just keep mine very brief. We support these recommendations by LA Sanitation um, to improve their hiring process, increase their overall staffing, and deploy the HOPE and CSLA teams to the areas with the highest concentration of open requests. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Shelby Lee. I'm also a Democratic uh, social, uh, DSA member, excuse me. Um, and I wanted to say that I'm really disappointed to hear that you guys are considering um, um, increasing the budget of uh, LA Sanitation by 17 million. Because if you've been to one of these sweeps, you would know that they're both ineffective and inhumane. Um, I've seen a woman sweeping the area around her um, and just like tidying her things and just um, like into a nice neat pile just to have sanitation like throw all of her things onto the sidewalk and so I'm wondering like is this really about cleaning the streets um, I've also seen a business owner sprinkle lye all over the sidewalk and if like and so I guess I'm wondering like is this really about making things safer for folks 
Um, so I, I really urge you to look for real solutions. Um, I don't think that adding a bunch of money to uh, LA Sanitation's budget is really the way to solve this problem. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'm Michael Steinborn. I live in LA and I'm a member of Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I heard a very nice groan, thank you. Um, I just wanted to give a couple cost neutral solutions to how these encampment sweeps are going. Um, a better way to inform the residents that the sweeps are taking place because as of right now, how I understand it is that signs are posted somewhere between 24 and 72 hours before the sweep and then when the sweep happens, um, if it happens when it's scheduled, I've also heard of it happening days to a week later. Um, the signs are currently only posted in English. Um, sanitation has told me that they are posted bilingual, but they are only in English. Um, and actually to clean the sidewalks and not just store and trash things. Um, with a hepatitis A outbreak, it doesn't make sense to Thank throw you. everything away and not clean the street. Gary Reynolds, Steve Ducey, Brian Raboyne, and Jonathan, who I think I called already once. So we'll remove Jonathan if he does not materialize. Yes. Hi, my name is Steve Ducey. I'm a resident of Hollywood. I'm also a member of the Central Hollywood Neighborhood Council Board. I want to thank the chair for the time that he took at the Civics U 2.0 class, which I'm a graduate of. I'm here speaking on behalf of myself personally as a resident of Hollywood and also a member of the Democratic Socialists of America Los Angeles. Um, I recently witnessed one of these sweeps at the Hollywood Rec Center. Um, there was absolutely no notice given to the residents there. Uh, there were no outreach workers at this sweep. There was city sanitation. There were several police officers. And there was a person from the Department of Parks and Recreation who threatened, physically threatened with violence, one of the people at this encampment sweep, who was justifiably upset at having their personal belongings destroyed by this sweep. That is unacceptable. To have nobody from Lhasa at this outreach and to have uh, this sweep and to have nobody from Lhasa reach out to these people beforehand is unconscionable. They reached out to us because they trust us. The police, they do not trust. And if we want to get these people into housing, we have to create trust with them. And when they see cops with badges, they get scared. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Raboyne. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Downtown Center Bid. I'm also a resident of downtown LA. So for the first part, what I'll say is I'm for the motion. I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. Um, I like the fact that you added a fifth team for six months. but. And I'm glad you see that, that there's a problem, but you're not seeing enough. Um, there needs to be more done. It's putting a Band-Aid on a ripped open artery, um, and it's really bad. Living downtown now, I walk my dogs all the time, all over downtown, and it's like playing tiptoe through the needle tips. It's, there are so many needles all over the place. As a bid rep, we picked up 35 needles, 35 needles on the corner of 7th and Flower, a very busy intersection. Um, so I think more has to be done. I have pictures here from the first and fig underpass, which I'd love to leave, that the trash has been there nine months. Nine months. We've called repeatedly. The 311, great, if it works. The issue is you have 311, you call it, they say it's closed and cleaned up, we go check it, it's not. Thank you. Thank you. Hi all, my name is Gary Reynolds. I'm uh, formerly known as Gary Ventura. I am a resident of downtown, former resident of Venice. I just saw your video. Great job. I think your initiatives are very, very smart. Mr. Wezar, you put on a really good party. Really good event. I appreciate what you're doing for downtown. I appreciate what all of you are doing here and listening to the people. Uh, I've been here since 1993. We've all seen it get worse. It's incredibly bad. I'm about to start a business here. I've got a 20-year lease. I'm looking forward to hiring people, making money, establishing uh, myself, uh, my family, growing this business throughout Lo Los Angeles. I'm really looking forward to you guys really uh, uh, paying attention to this homeless crisis. And uh, I'd like to uh, show my support for you in advancing uh, these funds for the trash pickup. I think it's uh, an extremely dangerous situation that we're starting to deal with. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. 
We have uh, Portia Pio de Rora. Hi, and my you have uh, two minutes, one for general public comment and one for item three. Um, I just wanted to say I, I live around Eagle Rock Plaza, and um, Sean Starking, uh, he's been really consistent in uh, the, the field deputy for Eagle Rock. Um, thank you for uh, um, advocating for the neighborhood and in, in regards to homelessness and um, illegal dumping. Um, I just wanted to um, thank sanitation as well. Um, the funding for sanitation and also for um, uh, homelessness, I think, should continue. And we need to be able to um, justifiably allocate the funding equally and just not ignore what's, what's epidemic now. So. Um, I like your idea, Council Weezer. I mean, thank you. Um, let's move forward with that plan as far as FEMA situation. And um, I think that um, just with consistency and just being on, on a roll as far as addressing the homelessness, you know, at least we can start living in a, in a better situation. Um, in my neighborhood, for instance, I can no longer walk around there and not feel safe. You know, so, uh, you know, it's been an issue for years now. It's, you know, it's almost like a, a schedule for me to call Sean or send him an email and send him pictures of, you know, encampments coming back as if it's, it's a chronic, you know, situation. And, you know, we don't have to do this, you know. I mean, I worked so hard for my money and pay for my rent. You know, I don't need to li live in this type of situation. However, certain people have you know, certain situations they have to deal with, the city has to step in at least and just be consistent with, you know, dealing with that situation. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, now we'll hear from... I'm so sorry, ma'am, I do not have your name in front of me. We'll... We... Tell me your name. Patricia Berman. Come on up and speak and we'll figure it out. Just for you, we're doing this. We'll figure out where we found your name. See what happens? See what you started, Ms. Berman? It's, it's trusting those uh, machines. Yeah. Okay. okay, go on. Uh, my name is Patty Berman. I am the president of the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council. I'm speaking today as a private citizen, a resident of the Historic Corps for 17 years, and the adoptive mother of a formerly homeless child off of Skid Row. I have some understanding of the complications and what you're dealing with. I really applaud Jose Rizar for coming to us with more for the cleanliness because there are children out there and they are getting sick and this is not acceptable. I know what a child, what happens to a child who is out there and adding to it this incredible filth does nothing to make the situation worse. So. Thank you for doing this, and please let's look at the fact that if every district wants the same amount of money, then perhaps they should start making the same amount of beds available as we have here in downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, as our uh, leadership from the Bureau of Sanitation is joining us at the table, folks should know that we have uh, a little over a dozen call uh, a dozen yeah. cards for general public comment so if your name has not been called and you ask for general public comment uh, we'll do that after we exhaust the item number three mr. Weezar yeah I just want to make sure the gentleman in the back got his uh, that he signed up for public comment correct and not, not that okay. yeah so mr. Zaldivar Good afternoon, Chair Harris Dawson, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with the status of LA Sands Livability and Environmental Quality Program. I'm Enrique Zaldivar, I'm the general manager of LA Sand. At only four years since its inception, 
we have fast-tracked our own learning curve and responsiveness to match up to the challenge and meet the expectations of your city council, Mayor Garcetti, and the community at large when it comes to the implementation of, of our livability and environmental quality program. We realize that in some ways, our livability program remains in development. We have attained a complete service mass balance in our bulky item collection. Mass balance to us means that every one of the roughly 2,600 requests that come in every single day get responded to within the promise service response, which would be the next collection day. That is a 100% mass balance. We have gained good control on the illegal dumping request with our response time at an average of roughly eight days or less. With a daily producti productivity of roughly 50 requests per day with no accumulation of a backlog. That's very important, no backlog being accumulated. However, as far as our homeless encampment cleanup program, we have made gains in both our productivity and in reducing our average response time. However, this remains the challenge. A challenge to achieve the levels of responsiveness that the public expect of us and that you and Mayor Gassetti would expect of us. We have a worrisome backlog accumulation of over 6,000 requests thus far, with over one-third of the requests being over 90 days uh, not being responded to. Our demand roughly in simple uh, general numbers clearly outpaces our capacity. Last month, we added two additional HOPE teams and one additional Clean Streets team, thanks to your council leadership and Mayor Garcetti's leadership and that we got this approved in this budget, and we now have them deployed, this year's budget, I should say. Drawing on our experience, the commitment of our staff, our partnership with, with our sister agencies, LASA, LAPD, city attorney, the community at large on both sides of the issue, we have developed what we believe is a plan that we are confident will enable us to match up to the demands of the program. We have translated this plan into a budget request, which is cur currently under consideration by the mayor and will be presented to you uh, when the mayor releases his budget. We have a series of graphs and charts to give you a more specific update on how each of our elements are running on the ground. I do want to echo that we recognize that our role in this larger issue is narrow, but important and crucial. We're here to prevent and protect public health and the, immediacy effects, the immediate effects of it. We can play a role in the larger picture, housing, and all of the supportive services that come with this issue, but we know that our role is immediate and narrow. Thank you very much. Adele. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Adele Hoshkwil, I'm the System General Manager for Sanitation. I want to uh, walk you through some, uh, some of the highlights and give you some background as to what we have and what we're providing uh, every day. But I want to echo what Enrique said, is we see our responsibility protecting the public health and the environment. Uh, without uh, the amount of uh, uh, health hazards and, and waste that would move every day, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think we'll, we'll have a, a huge issue before our hands. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Next one. What we have is, is we started in 2012 uh, with an epidemic a issue at Skid Row. We developed Operation Health of Streets. And then we grew over that as the issue became bigger and bigger that we need to take over uh, and, and expand our responsibilities. Next slide, please. Operation Health Street is, is focused in the Skid Row area, about 35 blocks. Uh, we have really transformed the services that we provide there. We are cleaning every street in that area once every two weeks. Uh, and, uh, and that's roughly we remove about uh, 40 tons of waste every month is removed from that one area in addition to needles uh, and, and uh, human waste and, uh, and sharps and hazards. Next slide. 
we expanded uh, Operation Health Street to go to Venice, which is a, another area that was critical uh, for, for us and, uh, and, and for the, uh, the concentration of the homeless community. And uh, we have now uh, have Operation Health Street with the support of council and the mayor funding to do that also. And we are there every Friday uh, to conduct cleaning. And we remove about 12 tons of waste every month uh, from that location, additional to needles and waste. Next slide. Uh, the, uh, we have, in addition, developed uh, new four, we put four hope teams starting in the beginning with 2017. Uh, these are not a cleaning teams and their focus is outreach, uh, which is a partnership between sanitation, LAPD, and LASA. And, and they were intended to be quick response, nimble and fast response to address issues like access, ADA violations, immediate health hazards needs that has to be done. In addition, we will do as much cleaning if we can within the resources that we have. These are very small teams, very compact, and, uh, and uh, their goal is to address these issues. Uh, and, and we have, I believe, uh, removed a lot of waste using these teams. In addition, we had about 150 tons of waste every month removed by the HOPE teams, and that's not, they're not their, their responsibility to remove waste, but they do that as part of their compliance with uh, ADA and, uh, and uh, access issues. Uh, we just recently added two teams as of this January. One is for the LA River HOPE, uh, and, and we, for the LA River uh, compliance and tributaries, and one is citywide. I'll talk a little bit more about each one of them. Uh, both of them are underway starting the beginning of this year, and uh, they're structured, uh, the Alley River uh, team is structured similar to the uh, uh, Row area, it's on a schedule. We have five zones in the city and those are on a, on a calendar and schedule starting from the west part of the valley all the way down to Boyle Heights but includes the tributaries, uh, including uh, Pocoma Wash, the Hunger Wash, and Royal Seco. The citywide team is, is still, we are, we're hopefully with your uh, uh, concurrence today and council, uh, we are looking at using that team to focus on high priority areas across the, the city, but mainly in the high concentration areas, which we believe, based on the analysis that we have done, is mainly in the one-on-one -on -one corridor, the 110 corridor, the 10 corridor. Those are the high concentration areas that uh, uh, we believe that should be focused on. Next slide. The biggest effort that we have is the Clean Streets LA program. I will turn it over to Khalil to take us through the program. Thank you, Adele. Uh, Khalil Garios, uh, Acting Assistant Director. Um, I would like to share with you now the, uh, the Clean Street LA program. This is, uh, we have five teams, uh, one added in January. Uh, the responsibility of those teams is just to uh, um, look at the requests that we receive from, the, from your constituent, from uh, the city resident, and then uh, um, create an authorization for cleanup. Uh, there is a process that we go through in order for us to just have the team assigned to do that, that clean, the cleanup activities. Um, they, with the, the team, uh, the, with all the sheer work that they have to do, uh, we have each team composed of four maintenance laborers, and three uh, refuse collection truck operator, and two environmental compliance inspector. Um, those are, those are the, the, the makeup of, of the team. Um, the, way, the way it works, and it was mentioned to you earlier, um, we, we, we issue the authorization. We have to just get it signed by the, the all parties involved, including sanitation and our bo board president and LASA to make sure that all that's taken care of. And then after that, it's posted. And then the posting is, goes 24 hours to 72 hours. We have to do that in between that, this time. And then after that is done, and LASA is involved is just to, to go out and then speak to the homeless population there in that particular encampment. And then that's when we go out and then just do the cleanup. Um, next slide, please. As you can see here, um, homeless encampment cleanup is getting more and more complex um, as we try to just uh, uh, be able to just do the cleanup just to make sure that, you know, that, that we're accomplishing our mission. Uh, it's getting harder and harder for us um, to be able to just do some cleanup, as you can see from these photographs. Um, they're, um, they're uh, homeless encampment under the bridge, and then actually they're being built up to have a home 
right across bridge areas, uh, river, um, and in areas that are really very complicated to reach in order for us to just do the cleanup. And that's sometime where you, you, you hear about some area that hasn't been uh, cleaned up and it's been, you know, over three months, four months, or six months because of areas like these. Next slide, please. Okay, the illegal dumping cleanup, the Clean Street LA teams are not only in charge of the homeless encampment cleanup, they're also in charge of illegal dumping. Um, uh, we do the service requests on both sides, and we just take care of both. Um, in the 2017 calendar year, uh, uh, we collected over 12,000 tons of trash. It was collected by our teams, both illegal dumping and homeless encampment uh, uh, waste and uh, 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 hazardous waste and uh, all material collected from, from the homeless encampment. Next slide, please. We also have, as part of our program, uh, trash receptacles uh, that are throughout the city. Um, currently, we're servicing 3,500 trash receptacles throughout, throughout the city. And then by the end of this, this fiscal year, we'll have uh, over 4,700 that we'll be servicing. Um, in the year 2017, we collected 2,700 tons of, of litter and waste from our uh, receptacle program. In addition to that, as part of our also program, uh, we have the clean stack. Uh, it's a da data-driven strategy to assign a, uh, um, a color to a, uh, um, a street segment or a grid. Uh, we started that in the uh, uh, beginning of 2016, and then we've been, every quarter, we've been uh, uh, getting more successful of cleaning up the segment and then going from red to yellow to green. Uh, the last uh, uh, quarter that, that we did the clean stat, um, uh, we reduced uh, the quarter 17, um, last quarter. Uh, the latest reduction, we had 1,097 green, green grid, 12 yellow, and 26 red. Um, the beginning, it was much, much more. It was, it was almost in the 200 to 300 red, and then we've been uh, uh, doing, being very successful on bringing it that down. Next slide, please. Adele? So, as I mentioned, uh, we've launched uh, early in January a uh, LA River Hope team. And as you see, there's five zones, and those are the zones that we use. And each zone, starting from uh, the West Valley, uh, they'll go through, and we spend a week in each zone working with LAPD, LASA, together as a team. Uh, and our goal right now is to ensure that uh, uh, there is a safe passage on the bike path and anything that is a health hazard or a hazard to the individuals, the homeless individuals in the washways or uh, blocking access uh, uh, around the uh, bikeways and the river, we will work with them to ensure that that area is clear. Uh, the, uh, we have done, uh, we, we've gone from the West Valley to uh, Tahanga Wash, uh, Pacoma Wash, and then uh, we go around to Arroyo Seco and uh, all the way down to the other river. Uh, the second team that we, we uh, rolled out this, this, uh, this uh, January is the citywide, next slide, the citywide team. And the citywide team is, is right now, we have done a soft rollout where we're assigning uh, the team to each bureau once, uh, uh, basically every week they go to each bureau to supplement the, the staffing. However, if you look at the analysis where the needs are, uh, where is the highest uh, needs and priorities where you have the highest concentration of uh, service requests and needs in the city. This heat map shows that it's uh, in the area around uh, the Hollywood, around the, the 101 freeway, the 110, uh, going all the way south to uh, the 10 freeway and that vicinity and the 10 in the industrial area. We believe those are high, high concentration of, of needs and we believe that we should use the uh, citywide hope to focus uh, the efforts and addressing uh, these areas, ensuring that we have uh, compliance with our uh, codes, but at the same time addressing and providing outreach and, and services. Next slide. The, the HOPE teams have been very effective. I know one of the uh, motions that we're responding to today is, is how effective. It's a partnership with LAPD, LASA, and sanitation. It's, the focus of it is actually engagement, providing services and, and, and linking services to the individuals. Uh, and, and I think in 2017, 
uh, our team responded to 1,500 locations, uh, uh, processed about 1,512 tents, removed 500 tons of waste, and about 3,700 needles and sharps. And the whole team, uh, including LASA, LEPD, and sanitation, had about 16,000 contacts with the homeless individuals and about 3,600 uh, uh, referrals to services. I think we've seen success. This is a, a, the goal of this is not just providing uh, safe access, but also connecting the homeless to services and providing that, that ability. So I believe that, that the system has been, has been good and, uh, and has been effective, and I want to thank our partners uh, from LAPD and from LASA in their efforts uh, in moving this forward. Next slide. So this one also confirms uh, the service requests that we're seeing, the concentration, uh, the areas with the highest concentration of service requests is exactly what I said before. It's in the, in the areas, it's across the city we have service requests, but the concentration, uh, and you see that in the table that we have in the report, is in the area around the Hollywood area down to the 110 uh, and the, the 10 freeway uh, south, so mainly in the, uh, the 13th district, uh, the uh, 9th district, 14th, uh, districts and, uh, and 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 the eighth and the ninth for the south, uh, and that's, I think that's where we are looking at uh, as we roll out the fifth CL, CL, CSLA team. We had four teams uh, until uh, January this year. This year we rolled out a a fifth team, which we would like to have the team focus on the high priority areas. This is really what we think we need to address: is the high concentration, where we highest concentration of service requests. But I think Enrique really hit on is the our capacity to respond, uh, the demand has outweighs our capacity to respond. Uh, we've seen a threefold increase in service requests. A lot of it is because of the public awareness, the education on, on how to call, how to report uh, through our 311, my LA 311, and I know uh, you have worked, each council member has worked, especially the chair of the committee has worked closely with the community to educate the community of how to provide adequate services, but we're seeing across the city. Uh, so I think for us to meet the demand, uh, we believe that the capacity has to be adjusted. Uh, I think it's independent of, of the the housing question. I think housing and services are critical. But this one is, I think, is, is, a, is a health issue that we believe that we need to continue to address and deal with and respond uh, because it's not just for the protection of the community, the, the businesses, the neighborhoods, but also the homeless individuals themselves. Next slide. And this is, just shows the service request by council office and we can see what the demand is in the, in the areas that I mentioned. Next slide. And you see, as we are, because of the demand is much larger than the capacity to deliver, even with all the efficiencies that we have done, with everything that we have done to increase efficiencies, to go out and do outreach using a area instead of using individual service requests, uh, to ensure that we go out there and clean an area, not clean individual requests, to help that increase efficiency, it still needs to be done. So as you see, over time, since we have a gap between the demand and the ability to deliver, that gap is going to keep adding up unless we do something. And that's really what we talked about is we're going to be work with the mayor and council on a process to inject additional resources to support that so we can ensure that the demand and, and the service delivery uh, are matched up as we support and work with everyone to ensure that services and housing and everything that needs to be done is in place. But those are have to continue to go together. Next slide. So the recommendations that we have before you uh, is, is basically, one is, is the staffing is critical. We've seen a lot of uh, issues with retaining people. Working in this environment is very difficult, and we're working very hard on how we retain staff to continue working. It's mentally, physically demanding. Uh, but also, it's, it's, we have a lot of vacancies and turnover, and we need to work with the personnel department to ensure that we uh, bring staff and hire new staff, and that's something that's important important for us. So we're going to be recommending working with the, with the department and asking you to, to support us in asking that these exams for the two classes that are critical, the, uh, the uh, solid resources, uh, truck operators, and the environmental compliance inspectors be continuous exams to hire into that process. And then also our environmental compliance inspector require uh, background checks because that, those are the ones that deal with, with uh, uh, 
the, uh, the uh, interpretation of the law and the enforcement, and what we need to do is ensure that the staff background has been done quickly. It takes a long time to do it, probably 12 months to even 13 months to do a background check. Wait, we wait, ask wait, 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 wait. Say it one more time. 12 months to do One a year. One year. To do a background check. Sure. So what we believe, what we believe we need to do is, is to give the individuals in that class the same priority as police officers uh, and give that priority, whether we work with personnel to provide them the staffing, et cetera. But I think that needs to be done because that's an important part of the process. Um, the uh, last thing also we're asking is that you uh, support and us in ensuring that uh, that the fifth team and, and the, 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 the uh, citywide hope be focused on the high priority areas and have that be implemented and work with you on and the, through the mayor and the council on the deployment of additional resources based on needs and, and data that we have to ensure that the areas with the highest priority receive the area the most uh, support. Uh, and basically at the end is the to work with uh, the mayor's office, the CEO, and the city council through the budget process to provide the resources that are needed uh, with your review, the mayor's review, and the CEO's review on this matter. So thank you. Is that it? All right, Mr. Rizar. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to the Department of Sanitation. Quite frankly, you guys are overstretched, under-resourced, and uh, we need to also find ways that we, you, even your existing resources, we have to find ways where we do go to priority areas. What uh, prompted a motion I submitted to review um, how we deploy our resources, the limited resources you have, and you're doing a great job, by the way. We have to um, address some of the issues that were raised about our protocols and in, in, in making sure we're doing it appropriately, notice, et cetera. But what prompted this motion was last year's budget when I was reviewing some of the data and of all the encampment cleanups and bulk item pickups that we have, the encampment cleanups request that we get and we have, I realized we did have 6,000 unmet service requests throughout the city and that a majority of those, 56% uh, or 60% are coming from CD14, CD9, and CD13. And then we looked at it even further and we realized that given the pace we were going, it would take us four and a half years to complete the backup and service those backups. And the frustration I felt, the frustration our constituents feel is that when they call, they call, they call, they call, and we say we'll get to it, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Well, it will take us four and a half years to get to it if we're being realistic. So uh, we asked for, in that budget, to increase the department's um, budget for these crews. We got one more crew. Uh, that's not going to solve this. Um, I appreciate uh, the recommendations you're making in the report. Again, this is the right time to do it in this budget cycle where the mayor's developing his budget. Hopefully we could get those additional crews. But the other issue we found is that um, I asked at the time and we said that those five crews were being distributed equally throughout the city when we had, you know, a higher concentration of backup request in certain parts of the city. Um, so my question is, um, hopefully we do um, pass, uh, you know, we get additional resources. You're asking for 13 more crews, which I hope we advocate and to the public. Uh, stay tuned. If you agree this is the right direction to get more resources to the department, it's going to take some advocacy during the budget cycle. Um, but you also requested here that we send uh, these crews, these new crews, or other crews, on to priority areas. Is that part of what you're recommending here as well? So that we just no longer say, you know, we're going distrib to distribute them equally throughout the city rather than now, I think you're recommending to go to priority areas, correct, as you're calling them? So you utilize the priority uh, because that's the, high, where the highest concentration of requests and in the, in the back, backlog exists. So we would focus focus the additional teams to attack the backlog in those higher priority areas, which became priority because of the higher concentration of backlog uh, requests. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're saying. Uh, our algorithm by how we deploy resources. I mean, we work with your field staff every hand in hand, but generally it's based on 
a higher demand gets the most resources, generally. We're now coming up with this higher priority because it's slipping farther and farther away from us. So we have to concentrate on those so that we don't completely lose them with, like you were saying, a five-year backlog and waiting time. So is your definition of a priority area the same thing as need-based? Is that's I mean, need to me, it's sim more simple. Okay, so it's need-based. It will shift from equal to need-based, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's what you're recommending. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and finally, you know, I just... Uh, uh, this goes in hand in hand with providing more shelter beds. The reason we do have so many people out living in, in our streets is we simply don't have enough shelter beds. And earlier we heard the other motion that we need to do the crisis housing, and hopefully we could move on that quickly as, as, as well, because some of the public speakers mentioned earlier, we could go out there and clean them up and clean them up, but yes, they're going to move somewhere else, or they're going to... Uh, 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 be back in the same location again. So we have to go hand in hand with uh, uh, prioritizing getting more shelter beds, uh, crisis housing at the same time, um, increase the budget for encampment cleanups because at the end of the day, it's, it's not healthy for anyone. The reason that Operation Healthy Street started is because the city was sued by the county for unhealthy conditions in Skid Row. And uh, initially, it was uh, quarterly cleanups. We shifted that to every other month cleanups, and we added the service component. So people go out there three weeks prior, offer the people services in Skid Row. And it's not healthy for the individuals, not healthy for everyone else uh, who walk the same streets. It's a safety issue. Um, uh, so we have to do these um, be a lot quicker. What I'm concerned about is that as we speak, there's an additional 200 service requests that are added each month, <laughs> and it, it keeps growing, <laughs> and, and, and we just have to do this immediately. If there's some way, as we're waiting for the budget to come out, to find some unencumbered funds, anything else, I'm all for that, because we heard how long it takes to hire someone. You're also going to be looking at cutting down on how long it takes to hire people. So. Um, it, it takes a while to get these teams up and going. Uh, and so the, if we find some funds or anything else that you could uh, recommend or anything else as we move forward, that would be helpful too, and we wouldn't have to wait for the budget process. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Weezer. And I'll, I'll pick up on uh, where he left off, uh, and I very rudely interrupted you uh, during your presentation to get clarification about the background checks. Because uh, one of the things that popped out to us uh, in going over the reports was the staffing question. Um, so could you uh, clarify a little bit on um, the staffing uh, for these teams and then this, this specific issue of the background check? Because that was quite alarming. The, as I mentioned, the critical components of all these teams are mainly in the environmental compliance inspectors. Those are the, the staff that will conduct the compliance with FIP 611, ensuring going through identifying health hazards, identifying personal properties, documenting all that, separating all the health hazards and properly taking care of it, removing needles and making the area safe, uh, and identifying what can be removed and disposed of and what needs to be stored and they will work with the team to do that. So there's a huge responsibility that goes with reporting, documentation, and pictures. Uh, we had a huge vacancy in, the, in this area. Right now we have 22 vacancies, that, uh, we, and we have a huge uh, uh, turnover attrition, and I want to stress the, the, the physical and mental impact has on the staff. A lot of them will uh, move to a same, similar job doing something uh, less stressful. Uh, so we need to continue ensuring that we have a, a continuous feeding of staff. And, uh, and, I, and I think we need to, and, I, and personnel department work closely with us in, in administering the exam and bringing people, but just the process of certification and getting people on the, on the list to qualify for this. We believe that that uh, uh, list has to continue allowing for feeding into it. So having a continuous exam that anybody at any time can apply and put their name on the list. Uh, we believe that's critical for that class along with the uh, 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 solid resources uh, operator. The individuals... I'm sorry, so you said you believe that you should have continuous testing. Do you have continuous testing or is that in happening in the near future? We will work with personnel. At this point, we do not. At this point, you do not. No. And there's no date that that's going to start? No. Got it. Thank you. 
uh, and we will work with personnel with your support to, to ask for that. That's important. The environmental compliance inspectors uh, are required to have a background check, uh, especially as they go through specific uh, part of their duties, and uh, they have, and that's that takes a long time. Um, and and that's something that we would think at times uh, it's it's very difficult to uh, you know ensure that the staff know that they have passed their background. Sometimes we hire them in and take that risk, and uh, and we have to assign them in different places in the organization because they didn't pass their background, but we have them already as employees. So I believe that's an area that I think we can work closely with personnel to give it a priority to ensure that the the uh, the background check is done in a expeditious manner, similar to any uh, like LAPD uh, officers, and uh, and we can work with personnel on that matter. So I think we have we have a good relationship. We've done good working with personnel. We appreciate their help and support, and uh, it's just uh, a, a process that we continue working on and and supporting. But the continuous exam, I think, is critical to ensure that we have a a bench that we can go into and hire as we are losing staff or staff are transferring out. So I just want to reflect back to you what I'm hearing at least, and you all know, know this work a lot better than we do. So you're saying that we, one, need to do testing, so that takes some, some amount of time. Then we need to do a background check that takes a year. So if we were to fund today, which is not going to happen today because we're not doing budget, but if we were to somehow figure out how to fund tonight these teams that these the 17 million nobody would see any impact until a year and three months from now at the earliest is that, is that what I'm a, please I'm dying for you to correct me and tell me that I'm understanding it wrong it Close to it, it takes, it takes the, the, the process of hiring and bringing people in takes time. And I think it's, it's, it's not every environmental compliance as inspector have to have background, but we need to have a lot of them that have background check. So what we have done is actually knowing that it's going to take long, we actually hired people in. And while they're on, on duty doing training, yeah. uh, we are going through the process. Each one of them have to go through extensive training. Uh, to get the the hazardous uh, material training, the certifications they need to be on the streets to identify the hazards that they need to do. All these things take time. So, yes, I mean, it's going to take some time, but I think we can make a huge movement in actually getting resources for the our our uh, solid resources team, the staff that remove the, 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 the trash and the, the, the solid waste. I think we can really get that hired and move this quickly because we have different processes of hiring as needed staff, etc. So I don't want to just put a, a, a damper on, you know, if I think we'll be we're creative enough to figure out how we can make it work, but I think they still need some help on the other side for that to happen. And um, just a question to um, address some of the public comment that we got. Do the people doing this work, in addition to the 12-month background check uh, and the trainings that you described, do they get any social work or any kind of uh, training that a social worker might have? If the answer is no, that's what I'm expecting. Formal, no. Okay, got it. But, but as a culture in the department you know we we have every employee have sensitivity around the very uh, uh, mission that they are being charged with you know being humane being sensitive to the folks that they're serving so that much exists but no formal training Excellent. thank you I just uh, just as a matter of editorial comment uh, before we go to um, Ms. Rodriguez it's at the point we allow a situation where 25,000 of our brothers and sisters are living on the street, we really are left with no good options on what to do about it. Uh, any way that we, ch there's no way to keep that clean because the sidewalks are not meant for people to live on. Uh, there's no way for people really to, to store their belongings and maintain the right of way. And so uh, I just uh, want to commend uh, your folks for the work that you do and the work that you do on a daily basis and acknowledge to you uh, that we're asking you to do a job 
that there really isn't a good way to do. There isn't a good way to take stuff from people who are down on their luck. Um, but we've charged you with, uh, with that task, and, and I want to personally, as a chair of this committee, thank you for the work that, that you have done and, and the work that, that you will do. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to echo your comments, yes, it's an incredible amount of work. Um, but part of what my concern is, because just on the ground, and, and it, it's reflective of some of the com comments that were made in, in general public comment today, uh, my staff is doing a lot to help coordinate on the ground with uh, LA Family Housing, because I've expended uh, discretionary funds for additional outreach efforts to align with some of the work around the encampments. But there's a lot of coordination that's happening on the ground level directly with my staff, working with Sarah Bell, who's doing an outstanding job. And we're, you know, we're really on the ground trying to do that, coordinated with LAPD on our own, which is much of the work that we were hoping one, one agency would take lead on, because you really do need to be a seamless operation for this to work effectively and more efficiently. Because when that happens, I think you're going to find greater success in what the, this, I mean, it's an incredible amount of work that needs to take place. But when there's a lag behind, um, just in the way it's rolled out in some of the cleanups, I think that's potentially a lot of the cause for uh, some of the uh, inefficiencies that are happening. And so I would really urge you to go back and look at that process and evaluate it, because I know oftentimes there are uh, tickets that are closed. Uh, to one gentleman's point, there are tickets that are closed that are, in fact, not closed. And you know we're going back and discovering these things on our own. And it, it really begs the question of, are we being most efficient with the resources that have been allocated thus far? And what could we do differently? And so I'm asking that you please go back and reevaluate that process. Because while we recognize that there's a greater need for uh, more bodies out there in the field to help produce, uh, conduct some of this work, the reality is, is the way that it's operating right now could be done, I believe, more efficiently. Because there's a lot that we're doing uh, to help in that coordination. I know many of our staffs and you know, many of us are subsidizing with uh, discretionary funds for additional strike team efforts and things for items that are not being collected. And it, it exacerbates an already big challenge that we have. And so I would really strongly urge you to reflect on what are some of the efficiencies that can be deployed. Because right now, you're talking about a process that wouldn't even avail any new bodies to support you for well over a year. So I would, I, I would really just urge the department to go back and do some really deep thinking in that, looking at, look at some of the partner agencies with LASA and some of the social services, because those are the most important parts. In my district, we have been absolutely successful in the seven months that I've been in office through our outreach efforts, helping facilitate individuals out of some of the encampments and some of the WASH encampments in particular into permanent supportive housing and interim housing. These things work well when they work in concert with one another. So I just want to make sure that those are efforts that are really being seriously reviewed uh, because at the ground level, I, you know, I can understand people's frustration, right? We're all, we're all struggling to try and address an what feels like an insurmountable challenge. But, uh, but I, I really want to suggest that, that that gets reflected very closely in this conversation before we, uh, you know, when we, to, to truly assess what the cost is going to be when we talk about the budget. We will do, Council. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rodriguez. I, th I uh, if there are no further comments or questions from any of uh, my colleagues, I'll thank uh, Mr. Rizar. So uh, I just want to uh, get clear on the process here. So if we, if we adopt this report, send it for Council, get the full Council approval, we're actually Council supporting the allocation or increasing the budget for 13 new teams, would that then go to the mayor's as he's proposing his budget? Uh, it's directive from council. So, uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Harris Dawson alluded to it. This is not a budget request that we're presenting. That is in the budget. Yeah. It is in the mayor's office right now. We're asking you to support it in spirit without necessarily fully knowing what is in our budget request. Okay, so. But the council adopts this recommendation, and so I'm just trying to figure out procedurally. The mayor's developing his budget right now. I, I would imagine he would take this seriously, right? And because it's a council-supported, uh, we don't have a sergeant at arms here that could clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, anybody could clarify that? Maybe the city attorney. I don't know. <laughs> what does this mean? I mean, is this a budget request or is this a council directive? It's not a budget request. It's not a budget, it's not a budget request. Right. Okay. It, it's a council directive, and the mayor would have to consider that in the development of the budget. Correct? I okay. believe so. I mean, it's, it's, if you look at the actual uh, recommendation. report, recommendation number four, yeah. says that instruct us to work with the CAO, the mayor's office, and, uh, uh, and the budget team to incorporate these things into the budget right. process. Okay. So, so it's basically still we need to work with the mayor's office and the budget, and eventually we'll come back to council through a process uh, of, of committee and then council. But uh, as he develops his budget, uh, or when the mayor develops their budget, um, each department asks, is asked for certain proposals. You will have this as one of your proposals when you present your budget to the mayor, correct? Yeah, it's, okay. it's already in. And we don't know if he will propose it or not. And even when it's to get to council, we would have to deliberate that if it's in there or not. And I'm just saying all this so that the public understands uh, what direction we're going with all this. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Wezar. Um, I, uh, that's important. I think if this, this were, in fact, a council budget uh, item, we would go to budget and finance with it. And so this is, it looks much more like a recommendation to the mayor for the next uh, budget. Um, if there is uh, nothing further, uh, I would uh, make uh, an amending, uh, amending instruction to this. And that is uh, that personnel and the Bureau of Sanitation report back to us on uh, the necessity and options for the 12-month uh, background check uh, and uh, present to us other strategies to expedite hiring um, with this specific classification that has so much turnover uh, in 30 days. Uh, it's time to go, folks. <laughs> you don't have to go home, but... Um, uh, so if uh, we could uh, consider that as amended, if there's a second, second, second it. Uh, if there's no objection, that'll be the order. Yes, sir. Excellent. Approve as amended. Perfect. Thank you. And so I have uh, about uh, nine public comment cards. I have an amending. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Rodriguez. Yes. So um, I'd like to call for uh, reconsideration of item one, please. Second. Okay. Hearing no objection, we'll reconsider item number one. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a, uh, a recent development, and I'd like to invite uh, H. Sid to come up and uh, explain some of the recent events that are going to impact the Summit View project in my district that we need to address before we go forward. Mr. Elliott. As, uh, as was indicated in the, the first... Uh, uh, amendment uh, there were uh, there some of the city owned projects projects on city owned property did not apply for the maximum amount of HHH funds and um, uh, there, there was a, a motion to uh, to increase the loan amounts for the projects in CD9 well there the one of those the residents on Maine that's also by LA family housing and uh, they have a project in CD7 called uh, the summit on view Summit, Summit View Apartments, mm -hmm. and uh, they've contacted us uh, as well. They, um, at the time the loan request went in, it was anticipated that the County Community Development Commission was going to be offering up to $3 million per project in the city, and the, under their recent uh, NOFA, they're only uh, offering a million and a half. So projects that were uh, including that funding in their capital stack are automatically short now, and uh, the residence is, is kind of a as close to a shovel-ready project as we have, and and they would if if they don't have enough, you know, we would have to come back in April, and and increase their loan amounts. And if we could do that now, um, you know, Excellent. they they could have, they Thank could you. apply for other funding sources, federal home loan bank, and so forth in in March. Just to make sure that they have everything they need to move the project along. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if we can go ahead and amend to. Uh, reflect, was it, what's the funding amount? Well, it would be up to the maximum HHH. Up to the maximum. Uh, okay. right. loan, uh, For the Summit View project. Here, no, no objection. Uh, that amendment will be adopted. Uh, and we'll go to <coughs> general public comment. Uh, one minute on topics in the jurisdiction of this committee. Betsy Starman, 
Nicholas Prevasich, S. Scott Norton, and Tony Hoover. You can get started and just say your name. Yes, uh, this is, my name is Nicholas Prevasich. I would mention Ms. Starman has already departed. Uh, I am a resident of uh, downtown L.A. I am uh, the president of the El Dorado Homeowners Association, but I am here in a private capacity. For what it's worth, I am a veteran. Uh, okay, I do applaud the, the new look that's happening as far as the 5150 holds. However, I will say those need to be minimum 30 days, ideally 90. These people are not being medicated. They're just being looked at, winked, and kicked out on the street. That does not serve their interests nor the interests of the public. Skid Row, quite frankly, over the past many decades, has become an intentional concentration of the most vulnerable members of our society. They are prey items. It is no surprise that a giant amount of predators has come in there to prey on them. And not all those predators are gang members. Some of them uh, wear suits, hire lawyers, and use them for power. If this concentration of shelters and charities in Skid Row and SROs creates an environment impossible for any recovery at all to, to happen for people who are addicted, people who have profound mental illness, and the conditions you've seen. It has its own tuberculosis strain. Not a CD14 problem, a Los Angeles problem, and an immoral problem for this entire country. Please decentralize Skid Row immediately. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. S. Scott Norton, resident of Los Angeles, native of Los Angeles, resident and business owner downtown, and advocate for the Broadway Theater District. I want to speak to item three, sanitation, and a general comment, but I think I pressed the buttons wrong. I missed the cards. Okay. Um, the people who live on, who are living on the streets are victims, and until we decentralize services and force every council district in the city to provide their fair share of services in transitional housing, Skid Row will continue to grow and fester. Criminals know that they can come to Skid Row and prey on our most vulnerable citizens. If we don't clean and remove tent cities on a regular basis, I know, I know, they will be used to shelter criminal activity, continue to be used as, to shelter criminal activity, and make the area a serious health hazard. We as residents insist that the city stops settling lawsuits that hamper law enforcement in their efforts. We should be enforcing laws that other cities use to help homeless citizens, not cave to every lawsuit. Councilman Huizar mentioned triage for Skid Row. Absolutely. Since we know so many, many people have been shipped here from other cities and states, maybe we should humanely distribute them to ev e more evenly throughout the city. Thank you, Councilman Huizar, for your efforts, and L.A. San for all the work they do, too. Thank you. So we'll hold our applause. Maybe we can keep the lights on. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Tony Hoover. I'm a resident of the San Fernando Valley. I'm a business owner. I'm also on the board of a major homeless organization here in Los Angeles, but I'm representing myself here at the, at the meeting. Um, I want to start by also saying I fully support your initiatives. I think they're a good start. Um, however, I just want to comment on something. Um, the present homeless crisis, especially with regard to the mentally ill, was willed into, into existence through like, legislation. It was a man-made issue. Yes. When the Lantern Man Act was passed 40 years ago, every community was supposed to contribute to the outpatient med uh, mental health care in replacement of the hospitals that were closed. What actually happened locally was that 11 million LA County residents have made it the burden of 5 million LA City residents who have in turn made it the burden of now downtown Los Angeles residents to deal with this issue. The result, Skid Row now has a, its very own strain of tuberculosis. The LaFon Parker murdered Dong Lee and as seen on TV, Skid Row is now the nation's largest open-air drug market run by gangs. Thank you. Thank you. Betsy Starman, May Zells, Caitlin McCarthy, Andrew Myers. Betsy Starman yielded her time to... Uh, to There's no yielding of time. Try. Good try. May Zells, Caitlin McCarthy, Andrew Myers. Oh, should I go first? Yes. I'm on the list. Okay. <clears throat> Tell me your name. Caitlin McCarthy. Excellent. Eight years ago, I moved downtown. Six years ago, I bought a home downtown. Five years ago, I started a business downtown. And two years ago, my mom was horrifically assaulted by a mentally ill person downtown. For the last year, every day, I have wrestled with the idea of moving to a safer neighborhood. I'm 28. As a young stakeholder in the historic core, I was sold a dream. If that dream is to ever come true, we need streets that are clean and free of airborne particles from dried fecal matter. My puppy needs to be able to walk down the sidewalk without mistaking a discarded needle for a toy. Skid Row needs to shrink and disperse, not expand. 
We need FEMA-type tents outside the city center, full of professional services instead of Coleman-type tent encampments that are often used as an open-air drug market and sex trafficking market for at-risk persons and homeless. We, should, we shouldn't have tents in Skid Row any longer. And we need to distribute homeless services Thank throughout you. the city. Thank you. And not expand it to 8th and Spring. Thank you. Thank you. I should be on the list. Um, What's your name? My name is Joe Burke. Yes, you're on the list. I'm a, I'm a resident. So hold on. Mazels, Andrew Myers, going once, going twice. Not here. All right, you're it, you're it. I'm a resident. I'm a business owner. I own a property on 6th and Crocker, right in the middle of the war zone, right in the middle of everything. And what I see every day, what I have thousands of hours of footage on, is absolute lawlessness. It's ridiculous that the city would even say that there's a court order and homeless tents are allowed to block my public right away. They are, if we don't enforce these encampments, what's happening is young people are coming out here, pitching tents, getting high, and making a weekend out of it. And there's more and more homeless tents that are coming down here that we'll ever be able to house. So we need to enforce this right away. I don't know why this should be my problem. Why am I the victim now? Why We have a big grass lawn right here. How come they're not allowed to be here in Grand Park? They're all around my sidewalk. Three of the tents are filled with nothing but bikes and bicycle parts. It's not even people, how, it's not even homeless people living in these, in these tents. Something needs to be done about this right away. It is absolutely the trashiest, most embarrassing place to live and work ever. People won't even get out of their car when they come and visit me. Thank you. I'm pissed. Cecilia? I'm Cecilia Nahar. Okay, first of all, you guys have the toughest job in the city, and you have the most important job, because I think... Poverty, homelessness is the biggest challenge of the next 10, 15 years. And my question is innovation. How do we shelter with the speed of FEMA? So I'm going to give you a throwdown. This is a city of innovation. This is the state of innovation. How can we get the best minds of the city as your think tank? How do we get, we have, we have Patrick Soon Shen just buying the LA Times. We have Elon Musk finding all these ways to bore through the city. This is a bigger deal. Affordable housing. Um, we used to be a city where we had music teachers who could live here. We had janitors who could live here. We are not that city anymore. And I don't want to live in a city where there's only rich people. Because I want a city of diversity. And you guys are the ones who are going to help us figure this out. And I really, really, if we can do Night on Broadway, which I grew up in Los Angeles, I can't believe we did Night on Broadway. If we can do that, we can do this, which is really innovate, change the conversation, think bigger, find a bigger paradigm for this. Thank I you. I know we can do it. Thank you. We have a, 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 a motion to reconsider item number three. If there's a second, we'll do that. Okay. Second. Uh, okay, we're re item three is uh, reconsidered. Thank you. I just wanted to add uh, an amendment for a report back on reevaluating their process uh, when it comes to the encampments and uh, just the notification process, but also more importantly, finding more efficiencies so that we can deploy more resources sooner. Excellent. I'll second that motion. Hearing no objection, that'll be the order. What does that leave us? That leaves the desk, sir. Thank you. Okay. We're adjourned. Sorry. Mr. Chair, right, right before you finish and adjourn, um, <laughs> to the downtown people who came, I just want to thank you because at the end of the day, we are experiencing um, uh, the crux of homelessness. We have the highest concentration. Everything you stated today uh, is right on, um, and we end up with our, the state and federal governments and also counties' failure oftentimes to deal with our mental health issue with the lack of housing that we didn't build for decades for these individuals, and it's all coming here in downtown. People come here, they can't get their services, they end up wandering our streets. And so a lot needs to be fixed, um, but um, stay on it. This is not the end of it. It's a great, I appreciate you coming out here because we're gonna need the same type of passion, veracity as we go through this process. It's gonna be a nice price tag to it. The crisis housing, 20 million, if we wanna do that in Skid Row, the additional, encampment cleanup, so we want to do that, 17 million. And it's going to be a trade-off that we have to do through the budget process. So please stay tuned. Please keep coming back and letting your voices be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weizar. I would join Mr. Weizar in thanking you all, uh, especially those folks who are new residents or new business people in downtown. For decades, the conditions that you see today existed for homeless people downtown. 
and there wasn't a whole lot of noise about it, and you all are bringing it to the attention of the city and decision makers and not letting up until we do better for you and for them, and so we really, really appreciate you for it. Thank you all so much.